Want to get a better pump for your next workout? Try this. It's super easy. Have a nice big glass of water with some sodium about an hour to 30 minutes or so before your workout. Believe it or not, water and salt are probably two of the best ingredients to give you a better pump. Sounds I remember magical. When I, I remember when I figured this out. I didn't this didn't um happen for me until competing days, until I was like tracking water and salt and realized like, oh my God. And you know, I know supplement companies hate to hear this because it's cheap stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean the yeah, the market Household for items. you know explode, you know, your nitrogen oxide and your creatine market is massive. One of the reasons why we love creatine, aside from the energy that you get from it, is the massive pump that you can you can feel. Um, but nothing, in my opinion, compares to water loading and, and sodium loading. And I, I would, I mean, I would say more than a glass of water. So my kind of formula before getting into my workout at noon or one—that's when I kind of train was could I get a half a gallon of water down and then like I back then this was before we had a partnership like LMNT um I was doing like two of those big dill pickles or I would just have something that was loaded full of sodium like if I ate out at this, this restaurant where I was having all kinds of salt in my food poof, the pumps were better than any supplement I'd oh, ever taken like citrulline arginine you know uh, all the the supplements that boost um, you know, blood flow is supposed to give you a better pump. None of them come close to being well hydrated and having a decent amount of sodium in your system before you work out. So here's what I, so I work out first thing in the morning, um, like around 6.30, 7 o'clock. So I don't even eat, right? So it's not like I carb load or anything like that. I don't have any food. Mm. I'll have uh, one of these filled with water. So let me see how many ounces this is. Something like uh, thir this is 32 ounces. So I'll make sure I drink 32 ounces of water and I have a full LMNT packet in here. Yeah. And LMNT is about 1,000 milligrams of sodium. Then I fill up another one and put another packet, and that's what I drink during, during my workout. workout. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if I do that, and I compare that to not doing it, if I don't do that, the difference in the pump is so dramatic, it's hilarious. And the reason why it's funny is because that m the market for supplements to increase the pump is so big, and people spend so much money. Yeah. And it's like... Salt and water. Yeah. Like salt and water. It's like the, the poor man's uh, options. So you have that, and then you also have like whole milk with like a little bit of uh, Ovaltine you know, <laughs> wow. uh, for a protein You didn't shake. age yourself. <laughs> no. Come on, who do, you guys do Ovaltine. No. Is, is Ovaltine still around? Does that I even don't exist? know. I don't can you even buy Ovaltine? Nesquik or something? What are we, you what are we working with Maybe. Here? You might be I'm pretty sure still. you can still get Ovaltine it. Ovaltine was the first... That's whatever. They still, they still dominate all the rest homes. I'm sure they have like some contracts. It's made, you know what? Some it's contract made? they signed for like 50 years with all the rest homes. <laughs> Mind Pub <laughs> sponsored by Opal Team. Yeah, they sell it. They do? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's on malt. Amazon. It's malt, right? Yeah, what is it's it? malt. Yeah, chocolate, it's like malt. chocolate malt. Chocolate malt. What is malt? It's from barley, I believe, or it's from wheat or barley. It's some type of. Uh, I don't know. Bro, exactly literally, you just said, told people to drink dairy with gluten. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> I mean, isn't that, isn't that what, like, crappy, uh, terrible gut right there? Well, right. you know what's crazy it's about your advice, Sal, that you gave? Because I'd take it even one step further. You're going fasted, which is amazing that you still get this massive pump, even without really any glycogen, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, you're super I mean, I have the dinner from the night before. Yeah, but, but I mean, that's minimal in comparison to, like, you actually loading. I bet if you actually did everything you're doing and you had, like, 70 grams of carbs real quick before... Yes, you know, I would. That, uh, you would feel a crazy yeah. in, in the rare moments when I can work out later in the day, which is what I, I love, it just doesn't happen because it's just... Mm. It's, it's impossible with kids and work and all that stuff. But if I can, then, yeah, if I have, like, a meal or two, you know, hours before, plus I make sure I'm well hydrated, plus I have yeah. good sodium... Then yeah, then the pump is yeah. You, 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 you pre workout just black coffee, boom. Yeah, there we go. A, a fun experiment for the, the got the, more tips. The <laughs> young people that are probably listening to this that would would uh, do this right is to to go and carb deplete for a few days, um, and then do your advice with the sodium and the water, and then load the carbs before you get into the workout. So let's say I go like three days of low carbohydrate. I'm going to work out the next day at noon. That that night, I'm probably having a big a big meal with lots of carbohydrates. In the morning, have another one, and then a mid morning before my lunch, like an hour before my workout, an hour hour and a half before another large carb meal with all that yep. water and sodium, and oh, you'll have one of the craziest yes. pumps you've ever. Now had. the pump itself uh, is does seem to signal muscle growth. Part of the, part of it is getting a good pump means that there's uh, the environment that you're in, right? The environment your body's in is probably conducive to muscle growth. Okay. So if you can't get a good pump, 
you either don't have enough, uh, you know, food in you, you don't have enough water, obviously electrolytes are off. That's not a great environment for, uh, for muscle growth. So the pump itself tells you, oh, this is a good environment for muscle growth, but the pump itself also signals the body to build muscle through uh, cell swelling, which signals muscle growth. And they've shown this to be a thing. Bodybuilders have known this for a long time. So, you know, it's not going to outweigh a good workout or anything like that. But let's say you're doing everything right. And then you say, okay, what else can I do to maximize my gains? Um, hydrate yourself, have some sodium. Element T is great because it tastes good and it's easy to put in your water. Plus it's got a little bit of magnesium and potassium, which balances out the sodium. And um, work out. Try, thir try 30 ounces of water about, you know, an hour or so before your workout with uh, the sodium, which is a thousand milligrams of sodium. So if you don't want to go the element T route and you want to just use salt, fine, thousand milligrams. And, uh, and watch what happens. Compare it to when you don't do that. It's, it's pretty wild. So I did that, it this morning. I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah, it's so crazy. That's the signaler then, huh? The cell swelling. So something like a BFR, that would be like the main um, indicator for muscle growth. No, that's part of it. BFR no, that's also has a waste the, the, the fluid coming back out, right? That's what that is. Well, yeah, but the cell yeah, but swelling. It's just the waste buildup. Yeah, the waste buildup is part of it also, though. Yeah. So BFR is all, like on, on a whole nother category. But just the pump itself. Um, can, can, plus there's a psychological benefit, right? So when you work out that psychological benefit of the pump, which people love, you know, if you're trying to develop a body part and then it swells and you could see this temporary muscle growth, you know, it's temporary because the pump is transient, but it looks good. It feels good. And I argue, and I used to do this with clients. If you have a muscle that's hard to feel like hard to connect to, if you get it pumped, then it becomes easy to feel mm -hmm. in your workout. So whenever I train a client who had a tough time, let's say feeling their glutes or their lats or their their pecs or whatever, pump it. Yeah, I would. Yeah, <laughs> we stupid, we get it in a pump. Too, <laughs> Thanks, Justin. We can't podcast with you. Sorry, after. I'm no, too no. excited. After right lunch, dude, hey. he's fucking no he, more podcast. He just told people to have dairy and gluten. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hey, try oh, yeah. this drink. I got to double down. Have some diarrhea. <laughs> yeah, uh, God, I used to drink Ovaltine. That was the first. Did you really supplement? Yeah, because I didn't even you know, know what was in it. You know what I used to do was like chocolate slim fast. I used to drink a bunch because my grandma had slim fast in there and i remember reading the label that's when i was an early trainer and i re remember reading the label i'm like oh this is like just a low calorie version and lower protein it's like basically a quarter serving of my myoplex shake right. and so i just drink four God. of those no, you didn't. Yeah, yeah so my grandma would have those little six packs and she used to get so mad at me where are my slim fast no, dude, you know, <laughs> hey you want to know what's funny so when i was a kid if something said diet on it oh. i thought it made you lose weight not that it was lower calorie. So I right. remember so I wouldn't eat diet. I remember anything. thinking that too. And and actually the slim fast cans when I was a trainer was when that that for that was one of those. Well, that's you know, when you understood calories. Yeah, we, well, we we yeah. talk about paradigm shattering moments in our career. That was a very paradigm shattering moment for me around the marketing around diet products. It's like, oh wow, a lot of these diet products literally are just a smaller serving of the muscle building product. You know, it's like identical. It just yeah. cut in half or cut a quarter. Have of you it. ever seen the low calorie sliced bread? It's like hella thin sliced. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a hundred cows. Yeah. yeah. Super thin. <laughs> Dude, it was it you blew my mind uh yesterday when you told me about tab being uh actually like they uh, changed it to Diet Coke. Yeah. I thought I, I I knew it like left the market and it was like a popular drink amongst women especially, uh, but then they just decided to kind of bring that in. So with that was Coke that, label. So, so Coke made Tab. That's right. Yeah. Coke made Tab and to experiment with like, like calorie free soda. Yeah, right? and that that market started to explode and Tab started to do really well, but it started to eat into its its core products. Uh, and they didn't and because the branding was so different and off, they didn't want it to to cannibalize Coca Cola. And so that's when they invented Diet Coke so that they could still keep the branding yeah. of Coca-Cola, which was probably one of the most brilliant. almost rival it these days, right? One of the I mean, most brilliant brilliant popular. moves ever. I know yeah. you were a big tab drinker, yeah? I was. Yeah. No, what are you really? I, my no. mom was. <laughs> I, I did drink it, though. Mm. We did have it around the house. You know, interestingly, they sweetened tab with saccharin. Oh, that's before saccharin. And was so saccharin got associated with cancer. Yes. And that's another reason they discontinued 
tab uh, was because of the association with saccharin. Uh, I feel like and that might tab. have been a bigger, maybe a bigger, bigger reason. Uh, the, bigger cancer, reason yeah. the cancer connection. Shit, yeah. you, I, I disagree with that. Maybe. That's never stopped anybody, dude. <laughs> it's a, it had to do with revenue, bro. Yeah. Well, no, well, well, no. <laughs> it was, no, a, I, I it was taking market share away cigarettes. from its 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 uh, flagship product. Well, no, I remember <laughs> that saccharin made the news. It actually made the mm -hmm. mainstream news back in the eighties. Yeah, it was in the eighties. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was around nineteen eighty two because there were rat studies that showed that it caused cancer. Cancer, right, brain cancer. So oh, wow. yeah, yeah. That's, I remember that now. Yeah, I don't know how long. So what I don't know, and that's maybe what that's what got rid of Tab, right? Because I think they both coexisted for a while. I think what Coca Cola did was, I believe, right? I don't. You have to do. I don't. You know, do enough research to speak completely on this. But I'm pretty sure what happened was they they made Diet Coke to try and bring some of that market share back, back over, to the branding. Yeah. But simultaneously, we're probably still running tab. I doubt they would just shut it down while I was making all that money, right? Yeah. So I'll have to research this more. Um, I don't know if there was an overlap there mm -hmm. or not. I'm pretty sure there was. Yeah. I mean, it would be kind of, it would be pretty. I drink tab and I lost 60 pounds. Yeah. You had cancer. Now, the other thing, oh. the other reason why they, they actually wanted to rebrand was because at that time, tab was like solely marketed to women. And yes. they actually, and so when they did Diet Coke, they co-branded it as like a, you know, what is, tell me. It was just discontinued in 2020. Tab? Yes. I, you so, know so, much, so much for your bullshit idea, but I, I told you the cancer well, didn't no, stop. No, no, it took the saccharin out. <laughs> oh, they just took that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that didn't stop the product, they, though. They replaced it with uh, aspartame. Aspartame, I'm yeah. sure, yeah. That's wow. You know what? Over. When you were talking about Tab, I'm like, I could, I could have swore I saw it. Uh, at the store. Wow, twenty. That's probably why it made this article, right? So it yeah. only it came across my, one of my things I read daily or whatever, and I was like, "Oh, that's an interesting story." Do you know, back then in the eighties, mm. it um, it was considered unmanly for men to consume anything diet. So that's why things like Tab were marketed to women. Any diet product, I, mean, I still feel that. Yeah, way. if a guy ate, <laughs> if a guy ate anything that was diet, like he'd be made fun of. So no diet products touched men yeah. at all until yeah, you know, that totally shifted completely. Uh -huh. What's up, everybody? Today's giveaway is Maps Strong. This is a strongman inspired workout program. Here's how you can potentially get it for free. Leave a comment below this video the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Also, we got a sale going on right now. You get Maps 15 Minutes, Maps Anywhere, Maps Prime, and our ebook, Eat for Performance, all together in a bundle priced for $99.99. That's a savings of over $200. Again, it's a huge promotion. If you're interested, this is a limited time, so act now. Uh, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. Much you know, later. another interesting story. You guys have any guesses on how well, like, the Jordan brand does with Nike? Do you have any idea? Like, you mean what, today? Yeah, like, and what it's done, like, is it, do you think it's more or less popular I when Jordan played popular. now? Like, or do you think it's still growing? Do you think in this recession? Like, what are your thoughts on how the, the business well, does? I mean, again, this is my limited knowledge, but it, uh, in terms of kids and, like, their excitement around Jordan brand, like, yeah. it's very prevalent. Like, like my son, like I know your daughter, yeah. like it's, it's still like the cool shoe like yeah. in it's comparison to anything now, else. There's just really nothing that's even close. Is it yeah. bigger now than it was before? Yeah. So it's consistently grown. They huh. just eclipsed $5 billion in revenue last year. Wow. What that means to Michael Jordan. Okay. So he made, he made over $150 million from them just last year. From the Jordan brand alone. So one that's year? It. Yeah, one year. 150 oh million. God. Do you know what he made in his entire career playing basketball? Well, probably way like less than that. 50 90 million. 90 million. Oh, wow. wow. 90 million he made his entire career of playing in basketball. That's his total collections in, in, in his, his, his uh, income, Dwarfs right? Dwarfs it. Wow. And last year alone, after, what is that, 30 years ago? <laughs> we played 20-something, 30 years ago Gosh. since the last time he touched the court. That's yeah. crazy. Ma making off of his shoes $150 million. Wow. Isn't that wild? That's hey, speaking crazy. of money, I got I got a great uh, article for you, Adam. I know you'll like this. Uh, well, I'll, this will be interesting for us to look at. So- do you guys want to guess what the worst college degrees are in terms of Art. environmental Hold on. horticulture? Yeah, <laughs> 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 horticulture would be good still right now, but yeah. so these yeah, are the yeah. worst Not environmental horticulture, oh, okay. horticulture in general, gender studies. Yeah, yeah, so this was pivot to the marijuana business. <laughs> so the New York Federal Reserve released the labor market report on college majors, um, and uh, these are majors that are just. 
terrible in terms of their value on the market. So you get one of these degrees. So are we going to get a list of them? or do we have I to... have a list of them. Okay, okay. But I then... want to hear what you guys... Well, here, I'll read them off. You guys let me know what you think. Yeah, because so, I know there's going to be some really rare yeah, ones that we probably... Like, no wonder that's bad. Well, right? some of them are really popular. And, you know, this is important, by the way, to know. And this is a conversation I have with my older kids. Uh, as I say, look, you can learn and study whatever you want, but I'm not going to pay for... Right, a degree that They're has not all going to make you money. Yeah, I'm like, not going to pay for a degree like that has anthropology terrible, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's just got terrible market value, and you're not going to get a loan for something with terrible market value. If you want to learn about that, luckily we're in the internet age. You can learn about whatever you want for almost free. If you're going to pay, you got to make sure that there's some market viability. It only makes sense. Doesn't make any sense to get loans for a hundred thousand. Well, I, I think that's a, a pretty. Uh, um, logical way to Very. approach it it's investing right yeah. just like you would invest in a stock or real estate like do your homework on like the likelihood of this is going right. to be a good investment especially five, if you can learn shit for free anyway right, right. okay right. so here's some of the worst ones number six performing arts yes yeah, so i knew arts so medium that. wage uh, in the early career is under forty thousand dollars the unemployment rate is 7.6 percent the underemployment rate? So this is like people who do it just part time. They can't get full time work. 64 percent. Oh, those are cool stats that they got. Yeah. Okay. Number five, leisure and hospitality. Oh, interesting. The really? median wage is thirty eight thousand dollars. Unemployment five point three percent. Underemployment fifty eight point six. You know what though? Think about it. Leisure and hospitality. So you're working in hotels and stuff like that, right? I don't know you had, uh, hotels, airports. You like, get a degree for that? Well, yeah. That's what I mean. That's kind of like, you, most people well, just you, jump in to and hop then, into management. Really? Yeah, for sure. If you wanted to be like a Southwest manager, I would imagine that they would want some sort of a Don't degree. Don't you think you would do better by starting there I mean, in a low position? You and I, would know, we all know that that's better for yeah, most right. industries. What, in, what industry do you know where you're in a position to hire others and you would not prefer yeah. no degree with 10 years experience? Just academic uh, accolade versus like experience. Well, yeah. I guess it's the ones with the high barriers where you have to have a degree. Well, and, and again, only because of that, I bet you if you were actually asked another doctor, like if you had allowed a, a person to practice underneath you for oh, 10 years, for 10 years, would Court, you rather have Courtney them? Courtney has opinions about that in terms of like how much she had to help educate a lot of the uh, doctors that would come in, you know, fresh from school and just get them like up she's and running. Yeah, because, because she had way field. more hands on, right? And they had no idea. And like, we're just like, constantly. and that's my point. My yeah. point is that like, even I think even a doc, someone at the doctorate yeah. level would say, but that's any, give yeah. me the guy or girl who's been in the hospital helping people for 10 years than the kid who just came fresh off his doctorate and know, like I, so here's another one that this one I wouldn't have guessed psychology thirty seven thousand dollars a year is the median early career really? wage Un unemployment four point seven percent now okay forty seven percent okay do you think that's because uh, a big bulk of those are probably like high school counselors probably because mm. I would think that a, a yeah because a, you would have to get like a PhD maybe be a professor really right because to be a psychologist I think you have to have a pretty high level degree. So these are, oh, yeah. yeah, these are, yeah, I doc, think these like, are like high school counselors. Yeah. That's what I would think it would be. Right. Yeah. And that makes sense that it would be lower, that much lower. Cause that sounds crazy for yeah. a psychologist. Those are the four that it shows on this post right here. So well, philosophy has to be worse. Yeah. You know, I want to look and see if there's, if I can see more of these because they just give me four. What a stupid post. <laughs> that, was a, that was the funny part. I remember I was taking all these philosophy <laughs> courses and was like, this is so interesting and amazing. And know, like, this will like never translate yeah. to any kind of like job is going to pay me money. Uh, I can't wait to see. Oh, here's, here's another one. I got another one right here. Uh, number two was social services. Sorry. Number three was social services. $37,000 medium wage, early career, un unemployment, 3% 3, 3 underemployment, 27%. Number two, family and consumer sciences. $37,000 a year. Now that's interesting because I think that would apply in marketing really well. And that would, so that's a community community service uh, officer. Um, nutritionists. Um, oh, number one. Well, I mean, this makes sense. Theology and religion. Well, yeah, I guess you're not going to make, unless you start your own, yes, start your own <laughs> church. <laughs> yeah. PowerPoint church. Unless you you're, start your own religion. Yeah, dude. And then you're, oh, yeah. then you're, then you're crushing. Then you're really like an entrepreneur. Not like, yeah. <laughs> so. That's why they nominate put, yourself. That's why they put median and not average. Cause if yeah. you throw average in there, people like, what's his name? Yeah. We'll throw that shit way off. Yeah. Uh, what's that guy's name? That yeah. dude that's got I can't the think of his name right now. Uh, what Joel, is his name, Doug? Oh, Joel, Joel Osteen. Yeah. yeah. Joel Osteen. Yeah. Yeah. Osteen. Yeah. People like that. What is he worth? I thought we looked it up one time on the show and we talk about him one time and then we brought, looked up. We're going to have him on the show, I think. We 
well, we were, yeah, well, when we met Tony Robbins, his people, they're like, he's a great guy. You got to have yeah, him. Yeah, they, like, they, that's they, interesting. And, and he was I don't know anything. I don't, I don't know, know him, him. anything yeah. about him. All I know is super than, popular. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, I mean, I appreciate that. We that, That's a way to, to say that because we don't know him. And I, I think I've learned my lesson of speaking out on people that exactly. I, I really have not spent yeah. the time in. Because exactly. In my, I've been surprised. So I've many been times. wrong more than times that I've been right. I've been wrong I've been in told both directions. things from other people. Yeah, there's been times I'm excited because I think they're amazing. Amazing because then the, you meet them and you're like this the facade like, they present themselves online and that everybody yeah. like puts them on a pedestal. Then you meet them and they're they're terrible. Yeah. Or I see somebody who gets trashed like Olstein who has a lot of haters, a lot of love, and so you think he's going to be this way and then they're totally different. Yeah. So. What, what does it say? His, his last name is Osteen. Osteen, not, not no, Olstein. I don't know why I say Olstein. What's Olstein? I don't old? know. I've said that for a long time yeah. as well. Huh. His uh, net worth is apparently a hundred million dollars, <sighs> and he generates around seventy million nice. in profit each year. Wow. wow. Yeah. That's now, what I've heard- That's through his books. It, that's right? right. So what yeah. I've heard is he takes zero dollars from the church. Now, I know I'm going to get somebody who's going to be like, oh, fucking- <laughs> yeah, No, it's all his he, books. Yeah. So supposedly, all the money that is that is donated to the church gets reinvested back into the church and the community, and zero comes for that. All of it has become from his- his book sales and the probably the courses and the things that he probably sells and sells and stuff like that. When it, when you think of it that way, it's like, well, damn, dude, if that's true, that's that's pretty legit. To, regardless of how you feel about the person, yeah, to you build, make your money to build author. that kind of a business is totally. Yeah. Re, 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 totally. It's crazy. All right, so something cool just came out the pipeline. It was a meta analysis on mental health, mm. and uh, this is a phenomenal um, article. Phenomenal article. So this was just this literally just came out. And the meta analysis, this is the title of the article. Okay. And this is huge, by the way. This is huge in medicine. This is like this is massive news. The title of the article is Exercise Could Be the First Line of Attack in Mental Health Treatment. First line. Wow. So they did a huge meta analysis. They they looked at a hundred study, studies featuring all modes of physical activity on depression, anxiety, and psychological distress across broad adult populations, okay? This is what they concluded. Exercise is as effective, if not more effective, than psychotherapy or pharmacotherapy wow. as the initial treatment. In other words, it did as well or better than drugs or psychotherapy. So what? Okay. So That's what so happened? Surprising. Who funded this? So okay. What? what okay. What happens? Obviously, this <laughs> is something. Fitness. This is a. Me- <laughs> I don't know. This is <laughs> I don't know. One. This is a message that we've been saying for a long time. Yes. Okay. We've already, you've already pointed to other studies that were already pointing in this direction anyway. So this isn't new news for us. But to have a a meta analysis like that, it to be mainstream news. What happens from here? Now, do, do we start to see? Um, some sort of lobbying yeah, like, against this uh, from the pharmaceutical companies? Like, do you see, are you going to see pushback on it and to, to kind of suppress the information? What do you think happens if, because if that's true. If I'm a big gym chain. I'm using that as my marketing uh, campaign. Like, Oh, I see how know? this is, obviously this is great for fitness, great for gyms, great for that side. But I think of the other side, the psychology and the pharma side, sure. which is big money and big business. Well, or do they adopt it and, and kind of incorporate it? That would be it. the most brilliant. Yeah. Right. So, so, well, so there's an interesting thing. So their, their, their speculations have to do with, you know, neurochemical serotonin or epinephrine. Um, you know, I would argue that's part of it, but it's also part of the fact that you are doing something, you're working hard towards something, seeing yourself progress that by itself also feels really good. But what's interesting is they found that resistance training had the largest impact on people with depression and yoga, um, had a better, had good performance with anxiety, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yoga, very peace related, you know, you got to kind of mind body focus, strength training, great for depression. But here's what I think about you know, here's my opinion on what you're saying, Adam. There's a big hurdle here. And so I don't think the pharmaceutical industry is going to care too much about this because here's the hurdle. It's always easier to yeah. tell someone to take a pill. Right. Yeah. Pill versus work. That's the problem, dude. The problem is- So you think that they're to, not even going to have to do anything about it? They don't it. give a they, shit. They, they're like, eh, it, it still requires work. It's not going to touch them. Nobody cares anyways. It's not going to touch them because, okay- um, uh, people have known that exercise makes you look better forever. That's a strong ass motivator. Yet people still don't do it or do it consistently. So I don't know. I don't know if it, now what might what this might do is it might get doctors and therapists and psychiatrists and psychologists to work with I don't know fitness organizations, trainers, who knows to work with them 
to help administer exercise or maybe use it as a prescriptive, like, hey, here's what I want you to do, just like they could prescribe meditation and mindfulness. But is it going to touch the pharma industry? You know, know what this reminds me of? We, <clears throat> you know, today we have a commercial for NCI and the girl's name is slipping my mind right now. So I feel bad that I, not to shout her out, but I, I, she was part of the VIP group that we were last Crystal, time. Crystal, I think. No, it's not, not Crystal. Crystal. Um, no, it's not Crystal. It's someone else who had the business that actually she was a therapist first. Mm -hmm. So she was a, a, oh, a therapist I, first, and then yeah. she's combined Crap, you know, I know you're talking about. her therapy. She's and in the group. The yes, group. Yeah, yeah. yes. And I remember talking to her going like, man, what like a cool... I just and you you bring this up like this has got to be incredible news for someone like her who's already moving in that direction of like she doesn't separate the two. It's like if you get personal training from me, part of that comes with like the therapy side and vice versa. So I always thought that was such a a, a brilliant oh, strategy. If you ask me now, what training a coach or trainer could go through that would benefit them more than anything in terms of like applying you know fitness and helping someone besides learning how to communicate effectively would be learning uh, like therapy skills yeah skills of communication with uh, by helping people through you know like what therapists go through i that that would make a trainer by the way trainers who've been training people for a long time you learn a lot of this through trial and er uh, trial and error but i think uh, i think that's got crazy carryover isn't yeah. that it's crazy because um it just goes to show too it's not ever going to be saturated this whole because everybody like that thinks oh should I get into personal training should I get into like the online coaching and all that there's so many different angles to it like this is another layer to that you could help somebody you know go through their anxiety like help them out with their mental health there's so. more there's more people suffering from obesity and mental health than there are people that could potentially help them yeah oh, think yeah. of it like that way yep. yeah I mean that's what makes that that's what makes this profession so amazing, which is also ironic too when I see trainers that have the scarcity mindset when it's just like, dude, there's so many people that need our help. That need good training. Yeah, yeah that need good help. The the fact that you come from a place of scarcity is such a, a naive place to be because of how many people you could spend your entire career trying to gather up all the people to help you. You know what? Is, you know what's interesting is you, you, as a train well, first off, if unless you're a licensed therapist or in a field uh, that's uh, regulated that way, you're not allowed to say, um, I help treat depression and anxiety. You're not allowed to say that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I wonder if studies like this will open the door for trainers- To be able to say that? To be able to say that. Like, I don't do psychotherapy, mm -hmm. we don't do talk therapy, but I do train people through physical activity to help alleviate anxiety and depression. Right. I wonder if that logical alleviation. Yeah, or just I mean, well, I mean, it, it's, it shows the data shows it's as effective or more effective. I wonder if you at the yeah. le okay, so at the bare minimum, if I was a trainer and coach, I would market myself that way at least. I would find a way to right? do it. Right. So 100%. Even, if, even if I can't make claims that I, you know, I uh, treat depression. I treat depression like this is one of, or, or that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can solve it or whatever like that. That I would say like one of. I would things, do something like like things that I specialize in. Is I, I work with these or, types yeah. of clients to help them with. X, Y, and Z, and then I think that would be a, a, a brilliant way to market. Yeah, and by the way, knowing what we just, I mean, knowing what we know and with a study like that, and knowing what we know about inactivity levels today, especially among the youth, okay, because kids today are far less active than they used to be, far less active. Like, I could walk around neighborhoods right now, and I won't see, I'll see maybe two kids, two kids, teenagers, whatever, outside doing anything physical. When we were kids, if you drove through neighborhoods, you had to like keep your eyes open and hit your brakes 15 times because people were out in the street playing, riding their bikes, doing like all over the place. I, I, you know, I know we like to blame anxiety and depression on the youth on social media and this and that. I bet you a large chunk of it's just the fact that they don't move. They oh, yeah. just don't move. They don't oh, go outside. Yeah. They don't move. I mean, they're deeply connected regardless. Whether it's gotta you, be. you blame it on as the as the main thing or not, it's, it's definitely deeply connected. Yeah. You know, you're bringing up something I wanted to ask Justin about. Before we move on to that though, since we were talking about NCI, I know that we are what about a month away from the big event that we have coming up. Yeah, I think it's the fifteenth of April, right in that area. And are um, they still taking signups for this? This is the big yes, they coaching. Are. This so is a big April. coaching con. This has got mm -hmm. Alex and Layla Hormozzi, like mm -hmm. and all kinds of other great speakers that are going to be there. This yeah, it's April twelfth through the fifteenth. Uh, and so anybody who signs up, and I believe you have to uh, book a room at the hotel. That's gonna, to get access to us. Yeah, we're going to have an actual... So you can go to this, go to the coaching con. You can sign up for it. You can go to it and experience all the speakers mm -hmm. and what NCI has to offer 
regardless if you stay at that hotel. But if you stay at that hotel, that specific hotel where we're at, then you get all of those amenities. In addition to that, you get the private uh, fireside chat thing that we're doing for the people that stay in that hotel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where uh, where is it? Is it Arizona? Is that where we're going? Yes, yeah, in yeah. Arizona. Uh, <laughs> let's see what part. <laughs> we never know. I know. Is it? I don't know if it's. Oh yes, uh, Phoenix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Phoenix. About, so back to what I wanted to ask Justin. So I don't know if you know this, but did you know that he took his phone from his oldest? No more phone. Oh I, well, permanently or just a year, like a week? Yeah. So it's it's a permanent thing. Um, oh wow. Yeah. Um, and. This is something like I was kicking it around and then I kind of ran it past Courtney and uh, just to see like what her thoughts were around it. And it was because what we've noticed is he just doesn't even really even miss it and uh, isn't um, out of the loop in terms of like his friend group. And and also Uh, so before there's no draw, you know, so before it becomes like another limb. It just, it's so addictive. Like it's, it's so, and, and I know every kid also is probably different with the usage of it, it was to the point where he was actually caught a few times in class pulling it out or like, you know, Mm -hmm. the, the, the one indicator for me was PE, his grades started slipping in PE. I'm like, how does that happen, dude? Like, (laughs) and I know exactly what he's doing. He's on here, like not paying attention to what's going on and like, what he's supposed to do to participate. And so I was like, that's it. And so it's been an experiment of a couple of weeks. I was initially going to bring it back, but then I'm like, I'm not bringing it back because it's just not worth it. Like, so the plan is once it becomes something that he's going to want to kind of fight for and negotiate with us, we'll allow it later on as a dumb phone, like a flip phone, like a, like a brick phone. Mm. And and that way he'll have access to calls, text messages. But that's it. honestly, all that other stuff is pure. You could make any argument you want to me. It is just a distraction. There is no value to that in terms of that versus the education he's trying to um, build at, at school and also like the relationships he's forming with his friends and, and everything on the smartphone is completely worthless in that regard. Wow, so was there bro. like a, a single event that led to this or was it like a buildup of multiple things that were happening? Like what made you finally just like rip the bane up and say, that's it, um, we're taking this I don't thing. know. I guess, I guess for me, and this is everybody's uniquely, especially parents, you have your own um, qualms with how you want to deal with this. But um, I just was like, if, if it's in my house and I, I just was kind of like, I'm pulling the power back. Like it's not, I just, it was an experiment. I'm like, okay. Like I, I was trying to rationalize, like, I don't want to be the, um, I don't want to be the, you know, the parent that's like hammering, like you can't, and like, you're going to, you're going to grow up without any of this technology, and, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, and be like totally like uh, uh, alarmist about it and, and have, uh, have him not be able to interact with his friends in a realistic way. Uh, but seeing how he interacts with his friends still without it and just kind of observing um, his behaviors now versus like with the phone it, it brings no value. So to me, I was like, this is on me. This isn't on him. He's a kid. This is my responsibility. Yeah. And so if it's on me, like, I just don't, I don't find any value in it. And he doesn't need to grow up with it. He can, he can experience that all later, like out of high school when he goes to college and that's fine. How um, long has it been right now? So it's been a month. Oh, wow. It's already been a month. Yeah. What do you notice? What are you seeing? Uh, he looks me in the eyes. Uh, oh, he's not distracted with the way he answers questions. He, um, is very prompt about getting up in the morning. Um, because I know that at night, like, and we're not always observing, but there's that draw, right? It's stay up it's late. there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Stay up late, like scroll through whatever nonsense. And just to like, what is he looking at? I don't know. I don't have a good handle on that. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, and he still has a laptop, you know, he still has like, yeah, but the likelihood he's going to get out of bed at 10 yeah, o'clock at and night the type over. things and, 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 and I'll, and whatever, dude, that's yeah. fine. Like I'm not like a micromanager and like a helicopter parent or nothing, but you're just making it, you know, you're, you're, you're uh, like we talk about with nutrition, you're, you're just making the barrier. barriers, yeah. make it hard. Yeah. yeah. Make so. it hard for him to get to that point where it's not just like you said, it's an appendage where he's just like, 
this like it to me it feels like a drug yeah. yeah how how resistant was he to it when you initially did it and then was it was there like a like he, did he flip out when you first did it and then it took a while to get him like acclimated and then i think it, at first he was he upset he obviously he was upset um and he, it was two it was like he kind of knew that his grades were slipping as a result of it and so he didn't really fight that fact he just thought he was going to get it back you know mm. and like he was like oh, okay they're, they're gonna let this blow over and do the same <laughs> old thing you know and like i'm gonna get it back and it's kind of like that whole uh you know how long can can i outlast them yeah. kind of a thing and um and i just didn't bring it back and then and he was kind of like he mentioned it the other day and i was like oh yeah do you miss it you know and he's just like honestly not really oh cool and i was like and then at, and to your point this is that was actually the definitive decision for me where i was uh -uh. like if he's telling me that it's gone yeah so and then, so and then how is he i mean because I, I think it's some of the challenges right like uh, if i was a kid it would you know, how am I getting a hold of my friends to go play or like get ready you know, weekends around? We're going to mm -hmm. all get together and do something. How is he communicating now? Is he doing it through a video game? Yeah. Through Okay. He can just do it through a uh, PlayStation. So he'll, because it's so much easier to manage that because he's out again in, in the living room and, and he'll interact with his friends or he's in our bedroom and he'll, you know, play. Um, but like I can hear those interactions and like him talking to his friends and stuff and uh and two it's it's like easier for me to be like okay it's an hour or it's like a half an hour that you have here and then it's not like the most painful ripping a band-aid thing off to get them off like yeah. it is to to take the phone yeah and you did and you did a good timing too because you wait till they're oh, 16 too late yeah 17 it's like yeah yeah they, already built, nice they already built a social media following and or shit they like built that just like their, their social networks with kids that are on there all the time and so yeah, yeah that's that's good kudos, kudos to you well we'll see we'll see dude i mean again this is like sure, such a social just started, experiment right. but that's sort of the plan i mean right you now. could always bring it back there's nothing yeah. wrong with him doing this for a year or two and then you know you, you know he's older and but, i i uh, actually think it's so funny you the, that's why i wanted to bring this up so i would I'd send a message to doug and i i think doug was the only one communicating with me i was high the other night <laughs> and i was like yeah, i have these high ideas sometimes right and i have this idea i'm like <laughs> Spaghetti or cereal. No. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's but hot dog he, flavored protein powder. So here's where what well, really? where where my my brain was at was you know I I, I obviously we're a, you know adults right so we're much more self aware than a young young you know adolescent right and I'm always looking for ways to improve my behaviors around this tech. I mean that's how powerful it is. It's powerful enough that I'm aware of it and I still need to think of ways. How do I create these barriers so I'm a more present oh, father? It pulls us, dude. Yeah, yeah. I'm a more present father. I'm a more present husband. And what are some things I could do? And I, I had this like idea, like, you know what? Like, maybe I'm gonna bring back the pager. And so <laughs> yes. if it's business related, like it's emergency, someone needs to get right, a hold of me, they can page me, right? And <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I can get to my phone. But, uh, you know, leave and start oh, putting like goodness. time constraints. Like I use my phone between the work hours of 9 a.m. to 1 and then it gets put away and then I have my pager. Like, and so I, so I actually started like, do pagers even exist still? And there's actually a big company that still sells them and the, millions of people. Is it still, Motorola still? Or what? No, it's not. Well, they, and Mot Motorola does make them, but there's a company that and I think I sent the link to Doug because I was like, let's do this. Let's start a trend. Dude, that's hilarious. But my point of bringing that up is I actually believe that the generation coming up I mean, you got to understand that your 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 son and daughter, and even yours, grew up in this kind of really transitional period when it comes to tech yeah. and social media. Mm -hmm. We we didn't have enough research and time to know what some of the unintended consequences are. And you know, initially, uh, of course, the kids are going to get drawn to because it's addictive, just like the adults are drawn to it. But over time, because we are a pretty smart species, and we look back and go like, wow. Look at all these things that are connected yeah. to all the addictive properties of this. I actually think that the next generation up is going to make it a cool thing. And I think you already see that. Yeah. Like with social media, like you now notice like real popular kids don't post all the time. It's like cool to not post. It's like you're you, more interesting if they can't find you. That's right. Yeah. So it's becoming a, it is becoming yeah. popular in the generation coming up again. So I do think 
that you nailing this right now is a good time. And I actually think it's not going to be that challenging because I think right when you're already putting a stop to it, when he gets into high school, it's going to be less cool to be addicted yeah, to your phone. Be. Most I, kids I, are going to, so. I bet you kids will yeah. start to call it out. It might I really be, hope so. it, you know, in the, the hard part. So, so Jessica and I are starting this where we're going to have a station where we put our phones at, at, uh, at the house. So if you want to go on your phone, yeah. you can go on your phone, but it's at, there. it's at the station. Yeah. And we're going to do that even with ourselves. Perfect. So if I want to get on my phone, I got to get up, walk over, and be on my phone at the station. Yeah. We literally just started doing this. The so irony I'll of let that. you guys know. The irony of that, right? Oh, yeah. Like the the old phone with the wire connected that everyone had to go to if you wanted to talk Listen, to somebody. That's right. That's right. Listen, I'll tell you what right now. We'll <laughs> hang up long this. long cord. You're trying to like close the door. Look, and- uh, look, I see it with us. I see it with myself. Like we hang up this podcast. What's the first thing that we do? Boom. On our phones. We'll all go out to lunch and we're all hanging out talking. Someone pulls out their phone. The other guys pull out their phone. Next thing you know, we're all on our phone doing our thing. And it's not like we don't, we're being rude or we're, it's not, it's not a conscious thing, no. which is what makes it even more dangerous. That's the thing. It's still totally subconscious. Totally yeah. subconscious. So how do you deal with shit that that's, that is that powerful? Well, the way you deal with it is you have to develop structure around it. That's the only way because yeah, and, and we, I can't, you're not, it's not going to happen by you saying, oh, I'll just use it less. It's just you're lying to yourself. Well, you know what else you lie. Tough, you know you, you know? lie to yourself too. Like I don't, I don't think there's anybody out there that has a business that demands their their phone any more than someone who's built a business off of a, a, a social media yeah. business like we have, right? right? But I fully recognize that there is productive time where I'm on that totally. phone, where I'm making business calls, writing emails, answering to a, a business relationships that we have. And then there's times when I'm scrolling, you know what I'm saying? And most of the time, That's right. it, it's bullshit. It's stuff that I didn't need. And if I were to like restrict myself to a smaller window, then I would only have the time for the productive stuff. And I wouldn't allow the other bullshit in there. But then when you make this justification that, oh, I need it for my business. Oh, I have to have it. Like, oh, that's crazy. I would never put my phone away like that because I have this business that requires this. Yeah. Really though? Like I, I bet if I actually put these window and this restriction, like then anything that hit me a- after that window would be there for me at first thing in the morning. And then I'd only have a few hours well, to knock it out and I'd I, get the shit done. Plus you I, have to train everybody else around you that that's yes. like your barriers, right? So this is the, the window that you have access. And it's like, unless you have that sort of trained it's like people will just expect that you respond immediately yeah well the idea because i'm i I can be quite resistant to feeling like i'm being controlled by anybody including myself i don't like this is why i've I've always worked for myself i don't like being told what to do i just have this and it's good and bad there's good sides to it and bad sides to it but the 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 reality is me putting my phone in a centralized location at my house is not because I'm being tyrannized or controlling myself or, or, you know, whatever, or my kids, I have to do it for my kids, but now I feel like I'm being controlled. The reality is, is here's what it does. I want to get on my phone. It makes me pause. It just brings awareness. If it's in my hand already, there's not enough time for awareness for me to be like, I'm like wasting time. Yeah, it's on that it. barrier. Again. But if I have to stand up and walk over to it and it's right over there, it's not like I put it like, like, you know, super far away. It's like literally right there in the middle of where we all hang out. But it just gives me enough time to pause yeah. to make me go, oh, okay. And also be aware that I'm standing at my phone and the other people in my household can see that this is what I'm doing. And so it becomes more of this visible thing. So we're experimenting with it. But I'm not going to lie, uh, like any discipline, it's going to be it's going to be hard. Yeah. The, the second stage is going to be this because I haven't done this yet. So the second stage is this. And I, you know, shit, I'm, I don't even know if I should say this on the podcast because I don't know if I'll be able to follow through is not taking the phone to the bathroom. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I'm ever going to abandon That's my, that's, I like that time. Uh, yeah. 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 I know. So I knew you guys would say that. Yeah, yeah, Everybody yeah. says that, bro. Yeah, yeah. I say, hey, let me, there's a lot of other areas I could cut fat out of my diet <laughs> before I cut it out right there. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. I don't want to go, hey, time. I'm not, yeah, I'm not time. ready to go back to yeah. reading the back of a shampoo bottles and shit <laughs> like that. I'm not ready for that. Country you know, living. Like, we, got no, we got no magazines in there. So yeah, I know. I'm not with you on that one, bro. Not yet. <laughs> I'm not I said that's the next step. bust out the National Geographic. I'm going to listen, just like we could coach people with with exercise yeah. you start one step at a time master the that's first next step. level right there yeah that's, you know, yeah. I, I think that's we'll one of the best places for it that's the best place for it i think yeah. is well my friends used to we used to joke this was back when i was even at 24 hour fitness that because i was I, I was actually really good about putting when we were at work at 24 
all my trainers put their their phones in the drawer and we actually used to we trained everybody to do that yeah. that's just you don't have a phone on the floor when you have clients right. either did yeah. i i keep it in there but when I would go to the bathroom, I would take it. Yeah. So my buddies would always tease me that like, are you taking a shit right now? Because I would be responding. You know, like, <laughs> I'd finally get back to text messages. So you oh, knew got me. if yeah. I was texting you, I was probably in the bathroom. And like, they were right. Like fucking nine times They should connect the phone to your bowels so it stops working when you stop pooping. Yeah. <laughs> and then see how long people stay in there. You know what I'm saying? It's going to be. So <clears throat> do you think, I think that's going to be, um, I think that's going to be a space, right? Like, I think that when you try and think of like uh, 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 merging spaces that are going to happen, like yeah. in in different industries and stuff, I really think that there's going to be. It's already starting. Yeah, there's going to be things around like how do we how do we learn to coexist yeah. with this powerful Listen, tool when our environments change radically. There's unintended consequences, and then, like you said, we're a smart species. Eventually, and it usually takes a generation or two. We then structure ways to kind of try to correct. So like, yeah. for example- We're examining it right now. Right. For example, if you want to be active, you typically have to go to a place mm -hmm. and schedule activity. It's called a gym. You know, 500 years ago, that would be the most crazy thing you could ever explain to somebody. You'd be like, listen, this is what you're going to do. You're going to go to a place. You're going to lift you heavy chop things. wood. Yeah. You know, yeah. You have to like kill something and you got to like- No worse. You're going to Burn pretend. things to you're be gonna, able to cook it. Yeah, you're going like, to pre pretend to chop wood. Yeah. You're going to pretend to lift heavy. <laughs> well, now you pretend. Yeah, yeah, they're going to be like, wait a yeah, minute. Yeah, you yeah. lift things and put them down. You lift mimic put them down, And yeah. you don't build anything yeah. with that? Like, yeah. no, no, no. Well, why are you doing it? Well, it's And you pay somebody to go in there and do that. And then, oh, and then you pay someone to tell you how to do it, It's almost embarrassing when you look at it It's, I mean, it you know, it's just, it's just, this is the environment and the, the, I guess the, 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 the success, the, the rules to success or the keys to success in modern societies is, is structure and discipline. Well, and the truth yeah. is we have to get to a, the unfortunate part for the generation right now. And what we're going through is the, 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 the dumb part of our species is we have to go to the extreme before we wake the fuck up. Like we're not the type to like the we first We never yeah. No, we gotta first we gotta first see some real bad shit happen yep. for a couple decades yep. for I us think to go we like just went through that. Hopefully yeah. you think that yeah, we that's we, what we I hit I, mean, level. I I really think that that's where we're at with this, you know, and I feel sorry for anybody who's what? between the ages of kind of five and probably fifteen, because I feel like you're right in the thick of that that group yeah, that dude. was like you know, born with the iPhone and just... We and I'm using it, so why not? realize you've been duped. Yeah, yeah dude. And yeah. you know what's really hard? If you guys really... I don't know. I don't know if this is true for you guys, but when I'm really trying to be self-aware of it, like anything that's um, unconscious, right? Not, without awareness, right? Some impulsive behaviors. Uh, if I take those away, I realize how uncomfortable I can be in my own skin sometimes. Uh -huh. So it's like, I'm like sitting here. I don't like being bored. I don't like sitting here. I don't like you know, not having anything to distract me, which means I got to be stuck with my own thoughts. Some people use food, other people use drugs, other people use, mm -hmm. and the phone can be a part of that. And so I find myself <clears throat> having to face the fact that I'm uncomfortable in my own skin mm -hmm. a lot of the time. That's just the truth. That's just full disclosure. And so it's like, I got to deal with this now. Like if yeah. I keep my phone over there, I'm sitting here, I'm like, huh, I got this weird anxiety right now. Yeah. Stress, or the baby's <laughs> the crying. work is dealing with it, right? Yeah. It's really like leaning into that. I mean, the ultimate test would be to be in line in the DMV without your phone. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, the that ultimate, te you know, yeah, talking about like it being God. like an industry that's going to, I think, explode over the next decade as like all these things start popping up. You know, one to that point is um, Aaron Rodgers just got back from it. A uh, retreat up in Oregon called. Um, it was a dark. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a dark retreat. And I think he, I think he was in there for three to five days in complete darkness. Mm. No phones, no tech, no nothing. By yourself, but you got no talking. And, hold on, you got lights and shit. Dark, like I think it was. I think that's why it's. It, was it a silent retreat? Yes. You can't talk. Yeah, no, he's not. Silent. He's not social. He's not with anybody. He's by himself too. Oh yeah, so Jessica yeah. did something like that. Yeah, look, look, at, look up what it is, Doug. Like so, I get my facts straight on where. Now, I don't know yeah, if I could do. Be I don't know if I could do that. That I have to be around people. That would be torture. I can't de deal with myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I will imagine that's would be the, ah, the extreme oh no. the extreme training for that, right? If you yeah. already have a hard time putting your phone down and being in your own thoughts by yourself in a moment, I'd be like afraid that. I'd cry or something weird. So it's I mean? four days, four days, <laughs> pitch black room. Wait, wait, wait! No phone, no television, See? no lights, pitch no black? distractions. Wait a minute! You sit in a pitch black room twenty four seven? Yes. Yes. 
So you don't see sunlight sounds either. Sounds like solitary no. confinement. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> that sounds like not a good idea. That's torturous. I, Your circadian rhythm and yeah, everything, you, yeah, you don't but, even okay, know what's going on. Yeah, but here's Sal. Look, don't get all alarmist. Four days, bro. Like yeah, we, Even the most long. extreme stuff for a, 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 by itself, he has to do that uh, extended period of time. Have you seen time. the studies on stuff like that? They've done studies on that to see how people's circadian rhythms become and whatever. And uh, I mean, you have to be... Bro, you cannot, you're not going to convince me that a, a four-day bender on Molly in Vegas is any worse wow. than, than going... <laughs> Why would you pick that up? Because uh, how many well, millions of people do that every here. weekend? <laughs> every weekend, there's at least a million people flying back from Vegas who just Molly. went on a bender for four days with lots of lights, lots of social activity, Speaking lots of Speaking of that, did you guys know there's a bunch of white powder like like just falling down from the sky in like Virginia, like what? Maryland? Speaking what? of Molly and what? powder. <laughs> what a transition. Speaking yeah. of powder. Is that I saw this. Okay. So and, and they, they don't were know what it is. They're like stay inside and like we don't know what this is. Did they ever and figure it out? No, they're still speculating on what it might be like dust storms, they said potentially from like Texas or it might but some people were thinking it might have been from the um, Ohio thing. Yeah, the Ohio uh Pal East Palestine oh uh, my crash. Oh god. It's so it's like a mystery. They don't know if this is like super toxic chemicals, just like you know, uh, fall, falling down from the sky into their uh, house and their cars and what everything. The, how so weird? Freaky. Yeah, and you just, looking it up, Doug. I yeah. saw an article on this too. Oh, you did? Yeah, I did. I didn't see anything yeah. on this. That's weird. But, so they haven't uh, decided. They haven't figured out what the hell it is. No, no. It's not so, cocaine or Molly, though, right? No, no it's not no. the fun. No. Powder. Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Molly's falling out of the sky. Yeah. <laughs> People wow. would be. Imagine <laughs> how happy everybody would be, though. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Until it's they died. Depression yeah. gone. Dude, you guys want to hear something crazy? Crazy. Did you mm. guys hear about this? Uh, this top international model uh, from Korea. Did you hear what happened to her? Have you heard the, this whole story? No, I'm waiting mm -hmm. for the punchline. There's no. not a there's not a punchline. Okay, let me hear. So top international model and social media influencer Abby Choi, okay, her head was found in a soup pot Monday. What? Boiling in soup. They've arrested her ex husband and three of his relatives in connection with the crime. Apparently, this and the body was dismembered what? and its parts made into Ugh. soup after a family feud over a luxury property. Wow. This is a real thing that happened. What? Yes. This is a like this 28-year-old model. Apparently she's really well known. And uh and that's what happened. What in the fuck? Did you see the guy from is here, the J V? Look, the, that's that's the that's them right there, dude. The freaking body was cut Ugh. apart and the head was in the soup. Brother in law. What is wrong with people? He, he's the one who did it? They I don't know, he got arrested over it. They don't I don't think they convicted him. He looks like him. a kid. <laughs> yeah, dude. Her well, head was in a soup. In a like, soup. Yeah, dude. Ew. Bro, that's crazy. Whoa. Yeah. That's in Hong Kong. Hong Kong. My bad. Because the ex husband and the in laws are the legends. Yeah, there was like a dispute over some property. That's gangster. Like a feud. Yeah, yeah, that's hella gangster. Wow. That's beyond gangster. <sighs> yeah. I that's, wonder if that's what it is. Is actually some like mafia yeah, like type shit. That's what that sounds well, like for sure. It's not yakuza, right? Because it's just triads Japanese. in Hong Kong or East. Is, is that what's over there? Yeah. yeah. I mean, is that the same? Is that like that's who Doug used to roll like, back in? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yakuza. <was> <laughs> <laughs> Doug's yeah. got the full tats. I just said that. I thought those were yeah. prison Dude, tats. Have you guys ever seen? Have you ever seen a straight up yakuza tatted up person in in, in real life? Yes. Yeah, so if they're wearing a suit, it's like everywhere you can't see, right? The skin exposed, yeah. but like everywhere else is. Tatted. So apparently, that's a, Doug. That's supposed to be telltale sign yakuza, right? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I mean, in Japan, I don't know if it's the same way now, but nobody had tattoos except for the yakuza. Okay. So I uh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say yeah. So they they put it down to their wrist. their wrist so they can wear a long sleeve shirt. Um and it also goes up to the neckline Yes. and, it, and then it, there's no tattoo in the middle here. So right. you can't so that see where the, the shirt the shirt's unbuttoned. Yes. So, so they, it's like the most gangster flex ever, right? Yeah, like a lot of uh, like these onsen which are like a, you know, like hot springs in Japan, they do not allow anyone with tattoos. So if we go to Japan, a few of you guys can't go into those. Oh, uh, wow. is, that, is that still a thing? Or if you have I think so. I mean, I think there's some that right do here. allow the uh, the tattoos. Yeah, see? So I was at the gym and there was a Japanese businessman and he was whatever. He, he came in and he was changing. He was workout gear and he takes off. He's right next to me. We're changing. He says hi to me. Hey, how you doing? Real nice guy. And he takes off his 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 business shirt, or whatever, and he full on had fully tatted, like Yakuza style. And I was Damn. like, what? 
Oh wow, sir, are you? Uh, no, I didn't say shit. I was like, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Either either he's pretending, my, but I doubt it. Who would get so tatted like that? And he was like in his, he looked like he was in his fifties. So yeah, where I, where are like mob, mafia, gangster, like cartel? Where is it most prevalent? Mexico? Would you say that's probably where it's most prevalent? Still? Like the cartel? Yeah, just like oh, gangsters, just organized, just, crime? Yeah, organized well, crime like that. Where do you think it's most prevalent? I know <sighs> Mexico, Ch Chicago has never left. You know, you thought of it like as the mobsters and the you know roaring twenties and all that. Um, but are we are we counting just the evolved? Right? Are we counting corporations working with government too, or you mean like, like yeah, that's the, the ultimate market? gangster because they're the most powerful yeah, yeah. <laughs> gangsters, pharmaceutical companies i would say uh, yeah. yeah yeah but they they operate with the law i'm thinking of people that are like straight up they're the ones that make the law you're right yeah yeah so mm. it's a little bit they are a gang gang themselves and or whatever but yeah where would you say it's where it's most prevalent yeah i mean the I ones think you think of is Mexico because well, of all the drug well, cartels. Colombia, Mexico, Colombia, most visible. Yeah, there, I mean, I mean, Mexico is the first I think of like like Mexico just what two months ago just shooting up airports. I mean, yeah. and no nobody doing shit about it. Like that's well, they cleaned it all up in New York, right? Uh, that was the prevalent there in the was the seventies. Like yeah, it was, it was like crazy. Well, and then I they know cleaned in, it up. in Italy, there's different mafia refers to the Sicilian mob. Then there's the Cal uh, the Calabresi. Uh, mobsters, uh, Drangata, I think they're called. Then there's the group from Naples. I can't remember what their name. They have different names for them. People always refer to the Mafia Mafia, but Mafia is Sicilian. But then different parts like Naples and Southern Italy, not Sicily, has their own. Maybe you can look up what the the Naples uh, organized crime uh, is called, but they have their own different names. So, so you, you, funny story. So my ex-wife's family is from a small town in Calabria, which we used to go visit, right? Back in the day. Camorra. Uh, Camorra. From, they're from Naples, right? Okay, so. Did I say it right, so? Yeah, Camorra. So the Ndrangata, so it's, it's ND, it's a weird name, but I, uh, we, their town got raided by the federal police of Italy. And it's this little tiny town in southern Italy got raided because apparently it was like, that's where like the head of the Calabresi Mafia was. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah, dude, I used to go visit this town all the time. <laughs> it's this little beach town that you would never guess. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty, pretty. How long wild. ago was that? Early. That happened. Uh, I want to say 15 years ago. Oh or... wow, not even that long ago then. No, no, no. It's a big deal. I mean, if you type in the town, you'll probably see uh, the town is Siderno. S I D E R. So, uh, Justin, your theory is that it's just as prevalent. They just become more sophisticated. Yes, and, and part of that you see in Vegas, right? Like it used to be all mob run, and then they just kind of pulled themselves out. You see corporations, but. You know, I think that they invested in a lot of the co corporations and the online gambling and stuff like that. I think that they kind of really helped to usher and evolve. And when I was in Chicago, the reason why is because I, I knew like guys at car dealerships and uh, strip clubs. And uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of uh, um, ownership was all still mob run. So it was like it, it didn't really leave. It just kind of like took on Evolved. different forms. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I've that that feeds into my conspiracy theory around some of these businesses that I see in the U.S. I mean, I've brought it up on this show before. Like, you see these cra these crazy businesses. It's just like the the math doesn't make sense. Like the square footage of that building in the Bay Area. You always think it's you always think it's. I do, I do. Well, you know, too, because of my experience in the the cannabis industry and how you know I was just in that what uh, 10, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, and mm -hmm. how much I saw it was corrupt at the city level. Right, the the mm -hmm. fact that we were we were paying contributions towards you know officials and stuff like that, and like you know cops right. coming down and you just like to get the heat you, off you there, donating right? yeah. to the whatever yeah. cause you know, and so you know we just get more sophisticated. So yeah, so I I experienced it, and we were nobody, right? We we're a very small level of what I was dealing with, and I thought, God, if this is still happening to someone like mm -hmm. me who's involved in this right now, I'm nobody. Like, and I can't imagine like how how deep this runs. Mm -hmm. It's got to run much. It just has become way more sophisticated with shell companies and being able to hide behind other people that's and right. organizations. It's like, dude, that's, that's what's right. going you on. You found so. an article on the, on the bus over there. Yeah, I did. Yeah. So yeah, the, the, this area is you referenced Siderno and Calabria. Yeah. Pretty wild. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, one more thing. Uh, I found, uh, just to, just so people understand the level of genetics that professional bodybuilders have. I sent this link, Doug, in the group text, if you want to pull it up. It's a video of Lee Priest when he's 16 years old, 16 years old, working out. So just you just look at this 16-year-old kid, and you cannot deny 
that there is an entire different species. He's 16 right there? Of bodybuilding genetics. That's 16-year-old Lee Whoa. Priest. You know, right when there. I see that, though, like, I, I, I have, like there's a Dude, part of me arms. that I feel bad for them that they went down the, the rabbit hole. Like, look how amazing he looks right there. Yeah. Like, yeah. if you just kept that physique for the rest of your life, but the the level of addicted to the body dysmorphia yeah, that you have yeah. to to go into that sport forever and to keep getting bigger and bigger. Well, you and get bigger. praised for like being a freak, you know, and like going like real crazy with uh, the potential well, of where you can go. He was getting praised. Like, imagine looking like that when you're 16. What do you think yeah. all your friends are telling you? Oh, yeah. You remember? You know who looks? Who, what he looks like? Who reminds me of that? You know, we have a a, a friend, who? the Jason Sinatra. Oh yeah. Yeah. Jason and his brother. Yeah, an all natural. Yes. Mm -hmm. Crazy looking. Yes. Crazy genetics. I mean, that's probably, he's probably, I, I would, 16. Do you think he's natural right there? Uh, Lee this Priest? Is, yeah, he is. Is he? Yeah, Lee Priest is all natural right there. He he tell, he's very open about when he started using anabolics. Yeah, I know he I know mm -hmm. he's open about his drug use. Yeah. So I didn't know if it went year oh, yeah. he started, but you look at that physique and you would swear that dude is on Bro, anabolic. there's no amount of drugs in the world that I could take that would make me look like him when he was 16. Yeah. <laughs> that's, how, that's how crazy his genetics are. Yeah, he had the best arm. I mean, dude. yeah, it's most of these bodybuilders yeah. you find. Oh, shout out, dude. I have a shout out for you guys. Who? This guy's a little bit of a prick, but you oh, should God. follow him. <laughs> I already know what you're going to say. <laughs> I already know what you're going to say. I like, I like how you're presenting my this. My bump to Stefano back on is Instagram. back on Instagram. Maybe a moment. So make sure you get in there and talk to him while yeah. you can. So we've tried to. It's like Sal Light. We've, yeah, it's yeah. Sal Light. I like that. We reined him in a little bit. You know, said maybe half the memes that you were doing before. We slowed down a little bit. Let's try and keep you on here for business reasons. I'm going to tell you all the secrets of the cabals that run the world. Yeah. I'm going to let so, you guys know what happened. Yeah, if you're not That's following Twitter. Mind Pump to Stefano, you can actually find Sal. He is back on Instagram. Hey, check this out. There's a company we work with called Organifi. They make plant-based superfoods and protein powders for health, wellness, longevity, and athletic performance. Go check this company out. Go to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump and get 20% off. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Madeline from Washington. Hi, Madeline. How can we help you? Hey guys, this is this is so cool. You guys have been <laughs> such a staple in my life and your program for so long. I wow, thank you for awesome. taking my question. Appreciate the support. Um, cool. So I'll um I'll dive right back in. Um, just a little background about myself. I've been lifting for about 16 years and doing your programs for about two. They've been super helpful. Um, but I recently started working on getting my metabolism up to about 27 to 2800 calories. And I thought that was a good place to dive into a cut from. So I dropped down to 21 to 2200 calories. And I noticed over about a week or two, there was a gradual increase in like some irritability and some depression, which is just not really like me. It was kind of out of character. So I was just wondering if you have you have you seen this before in other clients? Have you heard about this? Um, and I will also say that I am feeling a little bit better. I did a refeed for a couple of days. And then when I went back to drop into my calories at 21 to 2200 again, it was right around the same time that I was traveling for work and I got sick. So my movement and lifting were down. I haven't really done much since. So I've been essentially not in a deficit for the last week. and I've been feeling a lot better, but I'm planning to dive right back into training next week, hopefully if I'm feeling better and um, increase my movement again. So I'm just a little worried that I'm going to go back and start feeling a little depressed again. And I was just wondering if maybe I should approach this differently as I dive in or if you have any insights there. So I'm all ears. Yeah, good, good too question. much too fast, maybe. Well, there could be a few different reasons. <laughs> yeah. There could be a few different reasons, but um, you, you tried this once and you felt that way. You haven't repeated this to see if it happens again? No, but I'm planning to once I start recovering from this cold. Okay. So this, this could be a situation and I think I'm using the term right. Auspicious correlation. Is that the right word, Doug? Maybe look that up where sometimes people make correlations with things that are not necessarily connected. Uh, for example, you know, I've seen funny charts that show like when the price of bacon, uh, goes up by 15 <laughs> cents that the stock market drops 20%. Mm -hmm. you know, they'll make these connections that aren't really connected. <clears throat> they have nothing to do with each other. But um, you, you, if you, if you look at just those two things, they seem to be connected. So you've only done this once. There could be a lot of different reasons why you might have felt irritable and depressed that had nothing to do with the cut. Now, cutting can sometimes do this, but because your calories are pretty high, and you only drop down to twenty one hundred, it's unlikely that it came from the cut. Now, I'm not saying it's it's not possible. Yeah, you're in a healthy place still. Yeah, but it's unlikely. Now, I've seen people get 
irritable and depressed from calorie drops when the calories get really low. Um, so when I see people drop down to, you know, 1300, you know, 1200, a thousand or lower, then you can start to see this start to happen, but your calories are pretty good. Um, so it could be, it could be, um, what you're taking out of your diet. That's put, that's potential. For example, like if you took Justin and you put him on a cut and you cut cheese as the main thing <laughs> i'm pretty sure he would God go through yeah. i think he would go through a little bit of depression if yeah. that was yeah. where his calories were restricted from yeah. so uh, where did you cut from did you cut mostly carbs mostly fat a little bit of both like did you take a, a favorite food out or a meal that you normally eat consistently that starts your day was there was there any anything like that yeah it was a lot of um, mostly carbs is what i cut out my fats and protein are still quite high um, and before I went, went into the cut, I also cut out like sugars and things like that. So okay. maybe that's related. Yeah, it so, could. By yeah. the way, it's called a spurious correlation. I don't want to sound like an idiot. Make sure I fix that. <laughs> <laughs> it's spurious. Yeah. Correlation. I mean, some, some people, uh, I found this when I had, was coming from really high carb is originally when I reduced the carbs, I didn't like how I felt. So some people just do better on a little bit higher carbohydrates. And so maybe when you mess around with the cut, you manipulate the macros. So maybe take a little bit of fat next time and a little bit of carbs versus mostly carbohydrates and see if you feel better. That's, that's where I that's exactly where I was going to go. Um, if it was the cut, did you go from, did you go to like no carbs? Like what, what, what was, what were your carb? What, what did your carbon take go from? And then what did it go to? So I, right now I'm about just under 200 carbs a day, which feels, it feels not bad. Um, but then again, I'm feeling, I'm feeling good because I'm not moving a whole ton. Okay. So I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where I was at before. I just, I cut it out before I started, um, diving into the. Okay. So when you did the cut, you went down to about 200 grams of carbs or did you go down mm -hmm. to like 50? Yeah. I went down to about 200. Okay. So it's probably not the carbs then. Yeah, Sometimes when people go like really low carb, especially if their uh, sodium intake isn't isn't where it should be because it could pull water out of your body. That'll make people feel a particular way. Uh, now, here's another reason why cutting calories can sometimes cause the feelings that you have. We have lots of connections to food and different relationships to food. And there's a very strong psychological connection to, for some people, to reducing or restricting or what they may feel like is uh, restricting. So you may take someone... And depending on the relationship they have with food, now they, they know that they're restricting. They know that they're removing. And that alone starts to make them feel uh, anxious. And anxiousness can lead to irritability, and then irritability can lead to depression. So that could also be the case. I've seen also um, hydration and sodium. Yeah, that's so that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. So you, I mean, I, I don't know if you have tried using like LMNT, but using like a packet of LMNT and then making sure that you're drinking adequate water and see if that uh, has anything to do with it. I've seen clients before when they've gone on a cut, not realize like how much their water intake is kind of low already. And now they've just reduced a bunch of their sodium and the combination of not being hydrated, not enough sodium yep. in the diet could make them feel like that. So that's also a possibility that you could look into. I mean, yeah. obviously we're, we're kind of guessing at yeah. a lot of things. We don't have all the details, but th those are all possibilities. Yeah, there's, a, there's a host of psychological factors. I'm sure that, that went into this, especially if you're not feeling good and you got a cold and, you know, we kind of stack things a lot of times when we're not feeling good. And then, um, that sort of plays a, you know, uh, games with us in terms of like how, you know, we perceive what's, what we're doing. And so if you're like actively trying to cut and, you know, go in that direction and then you're not feeling well, so we sort of associate those two together. So I don't know. I mean, again, this is the first time it happened. So run it again. It would be interesting to see. I would, felt. I would 100% test it again. Madeline, if, if you don't mind me asking, uh, what's your history with your relationship with food? Have you ever dealt with um, any disordered eating or challenging relationships with food? Or, okay. So I, it's, it's unlikely that the cut was what caused uh, the way you felt. Uh, if your if your protein intake was high, fat intake was adequate. Those are both essential. Your calories didn't go down to some low, crazy low number. The cut wasn't huge. It's not like you went from twenty seven hundred calories to twelve hundred calories or fifteen hundred calories, which would be a big drop. Um, you know, in, in terms of percentage of calories, it's it's more likely that it was something else. Um, so I would try this again and see. If that happens again. Now, if it does happen again, because we're not going to be on the phone uh, or on Zoom talking to each other if this does happen again. If it does happen again, then my recommendation would be to do a smaller cut. 
So rather than going down five or 600 calories, try 300 calories and see if that does the trick. But I'm going to predict it's probably going to be okay. I don't think it was the calorie cut that caused uh, those feelings that seem to be strong enough for you to even want to call in and talk to us about it. So, so try it again, see what happens. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I hope you're right. That'd be awesome. And I'll keep an eye on the sodium as well. No, no problem. Madeline, I want to give you, do you have, what programs of ours you have? Would you like, uh, would you like (laughs) one on the house? I, I have a ton of your programs. Um, I think maps 15, I've had my eye on that one would be awesome. Send that over to you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. We appreciate the support. Thank you. Great. Thanks guys. You got it. So this is a really good example of the answer to this question would have been very different had she said she went from 1,500 calories to 1,000 calories. Yeah, an yeah. unhealthy type of Then I would have been like, oh, it, it, it might have definitely been. The, totally the different cal- state at that point. Completely. Yeah. But because she had got her her, her food intake yeah. to, a, I mean, that's a really good. Yeah, she's in a good place. Caloric intake for, uh, for a female. She's been working out for a long time. I asked her the question about food relationship history because if you have a history of uh, disordered eating or kind of challenging relationship to food, well, I mean, any perceived restriction can cause those sure. feelings with sure. somebody who has that history. Um, but I have seen the water and sodium thing, though. Oh, well, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, was, I would have, that, that's, that was exactly where I was going to go, but you got there first, 100%. Yeah. So if, if, she, if you haven't tried this and you're listening to this, Madeline, I would do that. I would invest in, and you don't need to get LMNT. You could just throw some salt in some water, but I mean, I, I like how many, I mean, there's like a thousand milligrams of sodium. And it in tastes this. good. Yeah. And it tastes good. And yeah. it's just easy. By the way, that's an easy thing to realize if you're like, oh, my God, I'm feeling irritable and depressed again. Mm-hmm. Go drink the uh, yeah, you know, jug like, of water with element tea and you'll know within 30 minutes. Yes, that's, that's why that's a cool one, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, it's that simple. I remember mm-hmm. I was getting headaches and then like, yeah. I remember, oh, yeah. I remember I had dill pickle. I had like a big dip and I was like, why is every time I have this dill pickle, I feel good. And I'm like, oh shit, <laughs> my sodium intake must <laughs> Might be, be another reason. <laughs> Our next caller is Johan from Germany. Johan, what is happening, my What's friend? Going down? I love those glasses, by yeah. the way. I think that's it's, awesome. Are you got the juve light going right now? What is that? Those are the dorky uh, Buddha blockers, which you guys always make fun of. Oh, uh, the blue, oh yeah, yeah. Because it's probably well. The, don't the fall. Different. Hey, don't fall asleep on us right here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Go ahead and ask your question, my friend. We'll help you out. I'll be trying to be quick. Um, so, first of all, really want to say, well, thank you, as everyone says, for all the amazing information you put around fitness. Thank you. Uh, well, health, fatherhood, life, like everything, and also a massive thank you to everyone on your team that normally is behind the scenes. So not just Doug and Andrew, but also everyone whose names I don't know. And then most importantly, um, I want to thank you for the personal impact you had on me or for the impact you had on me personally by um, introducing me to both Jason Phillips and MCI as well as Stephen Cabral and his IHP program, which I'm both running at the moment, which are amazing and have massively yeah, leveled up my coaching abilities and skills. Hell yeah. But, That's rad. Yeah. So first of all, lots of stuff to um, uh, to be grateful for. And now as far as my question goes, which is around implementing D-Log weeks in your programs, because despite listening to like every single episode for the last three years and hearing those phrases like, um, do the least amount of work to list the most amount of change, Adam, or to uh, what's the other one? That like that's a difference between what's what your body can tolerate and what's optimal cell. Um, I still can't get really over the fact that I just want to go all in uh, in every workout and really overdo intensity most of the time. So when I ran the RGB bundle, I didn't really make any progress when I was doing the low rep phase in aesthetic compared to when I was running anabolic in the beginning in terms of my strength levels. And when you then recently introduced the anabolic advanced, I was like, oh, deload weeks sounds like that might actually be the solution for me. So my question is, how would you schedule and then also design uh, deload weeks in your programs in terms of reps, um, sets, weights, exercises compared to the normal program? 
uh, in order to allow for the super conversation to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Cool question. Very Just, good question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good question. So I want to say this to you and also to anyone else that's listening. Most people get the, the comments we often get on our programs in all the programs, especially the core ones, right? Maps anabolic, maps performance and maps aesthetic. A lot of people say maps anabolic. I got such great results. Um, and then we'll hear sometimes people say with aesthetic, I felt over overtrained or burned out. Aesthetic is very high volume. And for a lot of people, it's going to be too much volume. This is a bodybuilder type routine. Anabolic is appropriate for probably 85% of the people watching and listening. Meaning it's not that you can't handle more. It's just, you're going to, it's appropriate. It's going to give you the best types of results. Okay. So let's get into deload weeks for a second. Deload weeks are phenomenal, but it's not going to solve the problem of consistently doing too much. It's like a band aid, and it can be a good band aid, uh, and it will cause your body to start progressing again, but it's not going to fix the problem, which is when you're training, you may be just applying too much too often. So I'll answer your question first, but then I'll tell you what I think you should, uh, what, what else you should probably do. With deload weeks with our programs, you, you're, you're probably going to do great doing one deload week after every single phase. So after phase one, you do one week of a deload week. After phase two, you do another deload week. After phase three, you do another deload week before you move to the next program. What does a deload week look like? Uh, this will this will make it easy for most people. Fifty percent, fifty percent volume, fifty percent intensity, fifty percent frequency. All three of those, not one, not two, but all of them. So look at your total volume, total frequency total intensity, cut everything in half. So if you're working out three days a week or four days a week, you're going to work out one or two days that week. If you're doing 10 sets for a body part, you're doing five sets for the body part. If you're lifting 50 pounds for 10 reps, you're going to lift 25 pounds for 10 reps. So it's 50, 50, 50. That's what a deload week looks like. It's not a workout at all. You're basically going to the gym and moving your body through range, you know, full ranges of motion, doing some exercises, and really you're just, you're facilitating recovery. You're not trying to do anything other than uh, facilitate recovery. Now, for you, what I'm also going to recommend is this. When you follow a program like Aesthetic, which is, again, very high volume type program, and this is for anybody listening, uh, you're probably going to be, you're probably going to get great results if you just cut the volume down by a third. So however many sets we recommend, do uh, one less. Yeah, do one less. If it's three sets, do two. If it's four sets, do two or three type of deal. So look at your total sets, cut them down by a third. Boom. The program is probably going to be um, appropriate now for you. So you can follow any of our programs. If you're finding that you're overtraining often on our more advanced type programs or high volume type programs, we'll then uh, cut everything down by a third. You still follow the same programming. Everything's the same. You're going to feel amazing. Now, you're following MAPS Anabolic Advanced. I probably need to say this to someone like you. In the program, there's an optional third exercise or an optional third set to failure or whatever. Don't do the optional third set or third whatever. In fact, I, you know, we actually got in a debate here mm -hmm. in the studio over whether or not I should even add it because we know people end up doing the <clears> max <throat> that we put in there. Um, most, The vast majority of people were better off not doing the optional extra so do the, do the, the, you know, with how it's laid out and don't do the optional with that. And then you'll probably get phenomenal results with that program. So a couple things to add. Um, one, just so you, you know, uh, that challenge maybe never ends. Okay. We here, we're sitting here on this podcast talking about it. We still have this challenge ourselves. So when you like to work out and you enjoy lifting weights, um, and you've seen great progress in the time that you're doing it. We, we tend to do that ourselves. Like we're always skirting those lines. And so it'll be a probably lifelong challenge of always kind of like motivating yourself to push and then learning how to pull back when you need to. Sal gave you some really basic uh, recommendations on the 50%. I think that's really cut and dry and you could pretty much apply that formula to any type of a workout. And that's a perfect deload week. I like to take a deload week and make my my client and individualize it. Meaning, if I was training you and you were you were complaining about certain things, uh, like my hips are my my hip my left hip is mm -hmm. nagging me all the time. Adam, right after a phase one workout or that, or 
you know, I'm really stiff here. Or, you know, I would do like a week of actually like, uh, since you have this, all the RGB bundle, like uh, performance, the mobility days, I, I, one week of like just mobility work would be phenomenal and specific to the areas that you need to be addressing. Like, like I just threw out the hip thing. I have no idea if that's an issue for you or not, but it's common, right? Somebody, they squat heavy, deadlifting heavy. All of a sudden they start to notice hip stuff going on. And so instead of just following anabolic by 50% on, I would say, Hey, this week we're doing all mobility work and we're going to focus on 90 nineties and your combat stretch and lizard with rotation and some scorpions. And like, I'm going to, I'm going to ha- pick a handful of mobility moves and you're basically going to do that all week long. Maybe I let you sprinkle a little bit of like uh, focus session work in there, some cable work for your arms or something like that, that maybe, maybe you don't have any issues in your upper body. It's just kind of lower body stress or low back type stuff. So maybe I let you do some shoulder work and some uh, buys and tries and do that type of work on cable machines for that week. And then all mobility like that would like, that could be a deload week for you and, and, and learning to tailor it to the area and no one knows better than you, right? Unless you had a coach or a trainer, like what you neglect, like that, you know, you should probably do more of, and I'm just going to guess that it's probably mobility recovery type active mm-hmm. recovery stuff, since that's a typically what most people neglect. And so I would, I would build a week of deload around that stuff. Yeah. I like that a lot. I, I was going to reiterate the same, same kind of stuff in terms of like really specifically targeting things that have been talking to you within your program. Um, like you'll notice like sh- certain tightness in your shoulders, your hips, and, and, you know, addressing that in the deload week is the best time to do that. Adding in uh, unilateral training is a really good way to address that as well. Um, so that way you can also reduce down the load uh, and, and really like uh, individualize and, and, and specifically work on one side versus the other to make sure that uh, they're both functioning properly. So, you know, just being a little more specific with it, but yes, like cutting that overall volume and that intensity down. What programs do you own? I'm um, currently RGB, and then I also got powerlift and split, although I haven't started those yet because I don't feel ready for them <laughs> in terms of the um, intensity. I, think, and I also got Prime and Prime Pro. Okay, good. You do have Prime Pro. So Prime Pro, you know, another one that would be worth maybe with Throw Your Way is MAPS 15. Dude, because I, of, if you did a cycle of MAPS 15, I bet you, oh, yeah. I bet yeah. you would love it. Do the 20-minute yeah. yeah. version. Yeah. That, your body would probably do well. Yeah, do the advanced sure. version, and I, I bet you would. Yeah, I, I like, bet your strength would go through the roof on that. I like that. Oh, that, that would absolutely be amazing. Yeah. I mean, I love working out, so doing that every day and just – reducing the time would be phenomenal so thank you so much yeah, yeah, yeah. you got it man. Yeah, we'll send that over to you. and you know what if you find yourself wanting to do more or spend more time in the gym or the workout mobility. do it mo- mobility that's yeah. it so follow maps 15 as it's laid out for the 20 minute version or the the advanced version and then if you find yourself wanting to do more or be in the gym longer just completely direct that all to mobility stuff from prime pro or from performance mobility yeah i mean with the priming up front that i normally do I will uh, anyway, uh, spend more time anyway. So. Okay, cool. Oh, good. So, good, good. Johan, so. thanks for calling in, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah can I say one more thing for any new listeners that might be listening? Yeah. yeah. Um, because recently you mentioned that in the beginning, people usually just go for the single topic episodes or skip the intros and just watch the or listen to the questions, which I also did. But... The more I listen to you, the better you get. Like the more I really appreciate the the interest because you always not just share entertaining stuff, but also some golden nuggets for coaches like me or just your own life. So yeah, really appreciate it. And um would definitely recommend to to stick into the podcast and uh yeah, making sure you keep listening. Thank you, Johan. It's a great compliment. I appreciate Thank you. that. Thanks, Thank you, man. man. Absolutely. You got it. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that, that's a it's so funny. You you could pretty much divide <laughs> most people who work out yeah. into two categories. Yeah, the, totally. I always do too little, and the I always end up doing yeah, too I much. Overdo it. Whoops. Yeah. You know, and it's uh, it's challenging. Yeah, you're well, absolutely right. You said we still do. I mean, I. Oh, it's we like all do. My, I mean, yeah, it's awesome. one of the, it's also one, I mean, uh, Doug and I were the other day, we we're talking afterwards and I was having this actual same conversation with Katrina because she's just like, man, you have this ability to like switch and, and get in shape so quick and fast. I'm like, you know what? That is years and years mm-hmm. and years of not doing it well and right and really honing in on like knowing how to apply just the right yeah. amount of intensity yeah. and to change. You my, know your body at a, a new level. Yeah. And, yeah. and honestly, 
the it's it's really crazy. It's very little. That's why you I I do I love hearing him you know repeat what we talk about with the you know doing as little as possible to list the most change and then what your body mm -hmm. uh, can tolerate is different than what's optimal for it because that is the game in this. The game is learning where and we're all unique and different. Is what what's the least amount I can do inside the gym and with my nutrition to elicit more change and I just want to tweak that. Every week, just a tiny bit. And we are you're so tempted because we get the hype and the motivation. And it's like, I'm making change now. I'm going to do this now. And they're like, ah, yeah. <laughs> you know, go we're, all. We're, we're so driven by momentum. We're such momentum driven creatures. And so like to uh, be all in is sort of like a natural instinct. You're either all in or you're all out. Well, and, and I think it's because, and I mean, correct me if you guys disagree with this, is that most things in life do reward you for that that extra effort and work right. you know mm -hmm. the, the old saying of like you get what you put in right yeah, yeah. the attitude of like if i work extra hard at work i typically get paid more or yeah. we make more money like if i do if i work hard at my relationship i normally see the the fruits of that for, but this isn't like that it's it's rare it's different it's unique and because yeah, of you're that you're limited by your body's ability to adapt yes that's it it's yeah. not like everything else where mm -hmm. more is better harder or pushing or doing it's like there, the there's irony a, a is sweet if spot. it was true if our bodies had this unlimited ability to recover and adapt this would be easy yeah i would just tell people oh well, here's what you more do. and more Perpetual and more and more progress yeah, yeah you'll, right? you'll go easy. crush you'll yeah. crush here's a seven hour workout and you're gonna get incredible incredible results it doesn't work that way our next caller is david from australia david what's happening man how can we help you hi guys uh i just wanted to say i'm really grateful for the opportunity to come on and actually ask my question. Uh, it's 2 a.m. where I'm at, so I'm a little nervous as well, so I'll do my best. I appreciate the call, man. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say uh, uh, thank you um, initially. So uh, I started listening to you guys uh, late last year, uh, probably around November, and I just started training um, in October. So sort of what happened over time was that I was learning things from lots of different places. And basically now I just look for you guys. So I'll, you know, check out your old YouTube videos or I'll have a question and I'll just Google mind pump at the end of it and be like, oh, I'm sure you guys have answered it already. Um, and that improvement has really helped me with not just my physical fitness, but then my mental health and my ability to be present in other parts of my life. So, you know, a big thank you to you guys for all the, the effort you put in. Thanks, huge huge yeah, compliment. Thank great, you. Man. Yeah. Uh, so my question is around sort of the topic of intensity um, and in particular, moderating intensity if you enjoy training um, hard as well. So to give you a bit of um, context, so over the past few, me few weeks, um, I've been pushing myself and sometimes I've been a bit over eager on upping the weight. Sometimes I'll fail on compound movements um, mid set, so I won't finish all the reps. Um, I also have um, uh, some pretty intense ADHD. So one of the things I've noticed is that when I focus and get in the zone, um, I don't get the signal that I'm fatigued or I'm at my limit until quite late. So I'm sort of the guy who always thinks there's one more rep in the tank or there's just a bit more juice to give, regardless of whether it's there or not. So um, my actual question is uh, sort of a two-parter. So the first part is what are some cues um, or some information that could help me figure out when I'm at my limit um, in terms of intensity. And then the follow-up to that is when I've realized I've hit my limit, what are then some techniques that I can use to help me moderate the intensity um, for the rest of my training session so I have a more sustainable workout? Oh, yeah. I love this question. Yeah. So fellow ADD uh, person over <laughs> here. So I can completely relate uh, to what you're talking about uh, when it comes to intensity when you're getting that that space in that zone. It's a superpower sometimes, uh, but sometimes it's definitely something that can be detrimental. Okay. So here's a few tips that have helped me with this exact uh, issue. Number one, you want to practice what you're talking about when you're not in the space or in the zone. 
because it has to be something that you, it's, this is a skill that you have to learn. And in that space or when you're in that, in the zone, trying to learn it when you're in that space is going to be almost impossible. So what does this look like? Before you do your workout, maybe the day before or a week before, I used to find that I was better at this the further I was away from the workout. So if it was a week before, I was much better at this, at planning this than I was the day before and definitely day of or in the workout. In the workout, forget it, everything out the window. But if I could do this the week before, when I felt calm and logical, I would write out what I was going to do. And then in the workout, all I would tell myself is, I'm going to stick to what I wrote, regardless of how great I feel, regardless of how much more I think I can do. So what that looks like is when I'm in that logical, calm space and I'm not in that space of like in that zone and, and whatever, and I'll say, okay, um, you know, last time I squatted, I did, you know, X amount of weight for this many reps. It would be, it's probably wise to stick to this weight for this many reps. So I'm going to do that. And I'm doing it in a state of mind where I can probably trust myself. Then when I get into the workout, I have that paper or I have it written down somewhere. I look at this and I say, okay, I'm going to trust myself because I know when I was in that space, I was quite logical and not feeling the way I am now, which is like I can do anything. So I'm looking at this and it says to do 10 reps with 120 pounds. So then that's all I'm going to do. So I get into the bar, I do my 10 reps and I'm like, oh my God, I want to do five more. No, no, no. I'm going to stick to exactly what I wrote down. So that right there helps a lot. And then what it does is as you practice this, you start to get used to the feeling of doing the appropriate amount of intensity when you're in the zone. So this is a practice. And the more you do this, the more often you do this, the better you'll get at recognizing what the appropriate amount of intensity is when you're in that particular space. Does that, does that make sense to you? Yeah, that, um, that does make sense. Okay. Um, I, I guess it also raises, uh, well, because that sort of technique is something you have, I have to do with like lots of things. Like I have to just hold myself accountable to a plan. Correct. Yeah. I stopped, right? I stopped listening cause it sounded like so much shit. So I don't know. That's, that's, that's <laughs> like a lot of, that's well, like a lot of stuff. Here's here. I think all of us in this room, uh, have been challenged with this. I think it's actually more common than you, you think that people want to do more. We, we were just having this conversation right before, right after the last, the last guest. It's a, it's a very common thing. You, you would be surprised how great of results you would get never even coming even close to failure, leaving two, three, four in the tank. Uh, yesterday I was, I was deadlifting and deadlifted in a long time. I started with 135. Uh, I got to 225 and 225 felt heavy. Now I'm strong enough to know that I could, if I wanted to go 315 and above, no problem, but it, I could feel that the weight was challenging enough that I'm getting work. And so there was no need to throw another 90 to hundred more. I could do a 90 to hundred more pounds for sure with the eight reps that I was working with. And I didn't go. I just, I just stayed at that weight because I know I don't need to. Here's a, here's a challenge with that, Adam, is that, that I think you're selling to David why he should moderate his intensity. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, David, I think you know that. I think the challenge is when you're in that space, you do it anyway. Is, yeah. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. right. So I'll, I'll give you an example um, of something that might happen. So uh, I'll use deadlifting as an example. Um, so let's say, for example, I'm doing a few sets of deadlifts. Let's say I'm doing like uh, a five by five or something like that. Um, I come in, I'm feeling good. I do my warm up. I do my first two sets and I feel like real strong. I feel like top of the world. And I'm like, maybe it's time. I think maybe I'm ready. I'm feeling good. So I'll do my third set and maybe I'll see if I can add an additional rep or I'll see if I can up the weight. And then um, I go for it and I go, oof, that's a bit too hard. And then um, what then so will happen from that is I'll go, okay, that was too hard. I'll go back to um, the weight and the scheme I was previously doing, but now I've gassed myself out, um, which sort of leads into that other question of saying, well, oh, okay, well, what is the best option for me from, from this point? Um, and, and, and I've done that a few times. So David, so, mm. so again, you, you, you were about to say something before you got cut off. You said that you have to do that with a lot of things where you plan and you set yourself up with kind of structure. 
Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Why do you why do you end up why do you do that with a lot of things? Uh, because I end up either doing way too much or doing way too little. Okay. So you know yourself. Yeah. You know that yeah. you get caught up in the moment. Is that is yeah. that is that accurate? Okay. Yeah, that's the aspect. Yeah. Okay. So th what you've done with other stuff, which sounds to me like that's a strategy that's worked for you, is what you should do with your workouts. Just what I said earlier. So I know Adam said it sounds like too much. I'm telling you, if you practice ahead of time, write down what you're going to do. And then the only thing you have to tell yourself in your workout is I'm going to do what I wrote down. Nothing more, nothing less. I'm going to do exactly what I wrote down in the workout. Do that. Now, what'll happen over time, which is now the place that Adam is talking about, because he's been working out for a long time, so have I, over time, you can make these decisions because you've practiced and you've developed a skill. Because I guarantee you, 15 years ago, uh, that was not a skill that Adam had. It was not a skill that I had. I did the exact same thing you did. I'd get caught up in the moment and I would lift too much. And it took me a long time, 43 years old, 44 now. And now I can do this, but I've practiced over time. So this is a, you just started working out in October. Yeah. You got to pra you got to <clears throat> develop the skill and it's not going to happen in the moment. What'll happen in the moment is you'll keep doing this over and over and over. And maybe it'll learn in 10 years, but if you want to figure this out faster, write out what you're going to do before, maybe days before, and then just stick to that. No matter how great you feel, just stick to that. Over time, you'll end up developing that skill and what'll reinforce that is the results that you get. Then you'll be like, oh my God, I'm feeling great. Oh my God, this is amazing. And then that'll reinforce the development of this particular skill. But if you don't plan ahead of time mm. with someone like you, this isn't for everybody by the way, but I'm, I'm, this is specifically for you. You mentioned your intense ADHD. You mentioned how this is something you have challenged with other things. If you don't practice developing the skill ahead of time, you're going to constantly get lost in the moment. And it's going to be very, very difficult for you to, to, to learn from. Have you been bringing a workout log with you and writing and tracking your sets and like how much weight that you've been putting up for each rep? Yeah. Uh, so actually, uh, I just finished the first phase of MAPS Anabolic. So I did the um, pre-phase as well. Um, so I'm sort of tracking along with that and I try to keep, um, my sets and reps consistent. And then I sort of play with the weight and see how that goes. How often do you kind of push it? So if you're running it just as it is like, uh, and you're kind of tracking and noticing what weight you started out with, like, when do you start kind of pressing it? Uh, maybe like. Gosh, uh, it's hard to say off the top of my head. I would say maybe like every, I let like a, a whole week pass and then a week or a week and a half and see how I feel. And, um, then that sounds yeah. good. Yeah. Okay. That I'm really just good. trying to see how you're like kind of perceiving this, when to kind of push, when to kind of just track and see what your ability is for that day. Uh, and just, yeah, the overall planning itself, it sounds like is, you know, this is going to be beneficial for you, at least for that knowledge of like, this is kind of my base and this is where I am with this lift and when to kind of like push and pull with that. That's, this is just something you learn as you, you build and develop more experience, uh, being in the gym. What, what is the, what's the negative feedback that you're getting from actually this? I don't, I don't even think we've covered that. Like we're just talking about strategies to get you to not do this mentally, but uh, why, why has this become a bad thing for you? What are you, are you, are you finding aches and pains? Are you seeing a, are you regressing and getting weaker? Like hmm. what, what are, uh, cause <laughs> I, I didn't even think to mention like uh, you could, this could be okay. <laughs> what, what? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so really the main thing for me, um, is, is trying to build that build that skill um more than anything like in terms of my results um i've been able to see like uh, a consistent increase in strength like uh, over time um so really for me it's more about um trying to understand and build that skill and then also um try to try to sort of factor it in into um, the rest of my like training because um, the past, like, I think probably a couple of weeks or so in particular, what I've, what I've started to pick up on is that um, that sort of like deadlift scenario I mentioned where I'll push too hard early 
And then I'm just exhausted for the rest. And I'm like, oh, I wish I could avoid this so I could be more consistent. So, smart, I mean, so another really smart approach. Yeah. You're, you're, by the way, you're going to make gains with, with, with a lot of mistakes right now. Cause you're so new. Yeah. Right. Also. So as a strategy, when I, when I have a new lifter, um, cause we always think of adding more weight to the bar as a way to progressively overload. So maybe when you plan this out, like Sal is saying, and you, you've decided you're going to do this and then you get in that moment and you're like, man, I definitely got more in me. This is, I, and I want to do that. But Sal, don't, don't add weight. Slow down the tempo. Yeah, yeah, good advice. So when when I have when I have a new lifter who's wanting to get good at technique and that's where they really want to focus, anyways, when they are tempted to add more weight, don't add more weight. Slow the rep down. You can make 135 pounds, and that's what I did with the 225. I don't so even think I'm, you're making a mistake though, even just kind of pushing for that because that's you're why not, I, you're that's not going to know. That's right? why I asked yeah. that too. I was like, it doesn't I, sound like you're. This you, is just it, data. This is, these are data points. So then you come back at your next workout, you know that like you pushed it a bit too early the last time. You just have to track that, yeah. so that way you don't make that same mistake. Yeah, and perfecting your form is so important. I mean, what Adam's saying is so valuable yeah. because because you're new. When something feels like you can add 10 pounds, you're actually going to get more value out of making the next set look even more perfect. Especially with things like deadlift and squat. Oh, like yeah. Literally, I'm, I'm in this 20-something years, and I'm deadlifting yesterday. I know I can increase the weight, but I also know like I haven't deadlifted in a while, and that's such a technical exercise. Like I just decided to slow my tempo down. And make it look even better. Yeah, and, yeah. Ju and just perfect how I feel it, how I'm, how everything's firing. Like it just and man, that made and I'm sore as shit today. So it totally made that 225 more than effective as far as sending a signal to adapt. So instead of you know adding weight, when you get tempted like that again, just slow the reps down. Mm -hmm. Don't add more weight. Just slow the tempo down. Mm -hmm. Take your negative, add an extra two seconds to your negative and watch what happens. Yeah. Or, or, you know, like what I like to do is I like to think of like, all right, let me ground better with my feet. Let me get my positioning even better. Was I tight in my lats while I was pulling this? Was my form absolutely perfect? Let me try right. and perfect it even pause more. Pause at the squeeze. Or yeah. The like of the like those mm -hmm. are all ways to progress the lift without having to add uh, more weight to the bar. And for beginners, I would invaluable. I would yeah. argue that yeah. it's more valuable than yeah. adding weight to the bar. Uh, ab uh, absolutely. That's exactly what I used to do with clients when we first started and they told me, Oh, this is light, Adam. I'd say, slow it down. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they'd want to add weight. And I say, no, slow it down. Like we let's do all that first before we could always add weight down the road. Like let's yeah. slow down and, and focus yeah, on the squeeze on and the, too. and resisting the negative and like, you know, pausing in the contraction. Like, I mean, yeah. there's so many things that we can do with the technique of it, Sal's point, gripping with the floor and thinking of the position of your neck and your head and your core. And like, there's so many other parts with a, especially a technical lift, like the deadlift that I can progress you in without ever adding load to the bar. And you will see progression. You'll get better. You'll get stronger. You'll build muscle. And we don't have to add, you know, 15, 20 more pounds to the bar. Yeah. And then the other part of your question was, well, you know, what if you do make that mistake? How do I get back into the workout? Don't go back to the weight uh, yeah. that you don't go back to the weight that you had before. Yeah. Go to something lighter. Yeah, reduce it a bit. Yeah, because when you fail with a weight, you your your you fry your your CNS gets a little bit more fried. So it's not gonna give you the same output. Yeah. So you can't always go back to the the weight that you had on the bar before. So let's say you went you went from 175 to 225. 225 was too much. Now you're exhausted. Go down to 155, not to 175. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah, yeah, that does make sense. Um, and I wanted to ask about the, that a little, a little bit. Um, uh, so I think I can sort of guess what the answer is based on the direction you guys are going in. But would that it if if I do that? So let's say let's say that exact scenario is I drop the weight below where I was at before. Is that just purely an indication of the fatigue that I'm now feeling? Like it doesn't have any effect on um, the quality of the workout or oh, the no. results or anything like that. No, yeah, no, no, yeah, if no. anything, that's not, that's now you've, you've saved the workout. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I've done yeah. it to the point where in the stronger you get, the more this is even the more of an impact this has. If I'm doing a full body workout and I start with say squats or deadlifts and I do what you did where I, like I, I went through the, the, <laughs> the rest of the workout is easy. Yeah. Yeah. Not just the rest of the deadlift workout or the rest of the squat workout. All oh, right. The rest of the entire workout is easier. And it's not because I'm like, ah, oh, scratch this workout. I've lost. I, I saved the workout and I still progress. Yeah. No, that's a, that's really good. That's really good advice because, um, 
Um, I think I've started heading in that direction. Like, um, so with squats as one, one example, um, one of the things I'm doing with that now is that, uh, because, because I'm fairly tall, so, um, I'm like just above six foot. When I started learning to squat, my range of motion like sucked because like I had to like move a lot. My balance isn't great, that sort of thing. So now that I sort of feel confident with the movement, um, I've actually been lowering the weight a bit and trying to focus on depth Good. and my ability to like hold Perfect, it, man. get out of the hole, like safely, go. all that sort of stuff. Perfect. Great choice. Well, that's it. hundred percent. You must yeah. listen to a great podcast. I know you're on track. Man. You're on track. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I did say at the start uh, that I stopped learning from other places just from you guys. So uh, awesome. if you didn't like that answer, well. <laughs> David, what, what maps program are you following right now? Uh, I'm following Anabolic right now. Um, I bought the um, the New awesome. Year bundle. So oh. I have like Anabolic performance and oh, aesthetic set. kit oh. up to go. Oh, you're set, man. You're good. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Good job, man. Yeah. Thank you. You got it, mate. Thanks Thank for calling. Yeah. Keep it up. Thank you very much. You know, uh, good, good I, question. I, yeah, it was good. but you know what? Uh, we just went into like answering it, and I'm like, I know, yeah, I, I didn't actually hear an, a real problem yeah. with yeah. that. Like, but he had a great he's so to new that. to yeah lifting. So yeah, I had to like kind of bring it back. Yeah, I, to, like, I get a little. Thoughts, it's yeah. funny because I, I, I he listening to him yeah. say his his reason for it when you asked because I thought it was a great question you asked him. Um, like how great. Uh, of a position is he is, is he in as a beginner to to realize and, yeah, yeah you know it's because he's listening to our show i think oh it's no his mindset's perfect yeah for him to be like well i just want to learn this skill oh yeah. my god i wish I, totally. I had that mindset as a kid working out i would have gotten so much better results yeah a bit of overthinking though it is yeah, yeah. I, I think like to justin's point like you know it's kind of that's now i mean this happens to me still to this day where i put a little too much on the bar, realize, oh, that was yeah. too much. Then I got to go back the other way. And it's like, you know. But I mean, I'll tell you what, you know, when he mentioned his, his how he feels, and then he said, oh yeah, I have to do that with a lot of things. I know what that's, that I, un I understand what that's like. It's, it's, there's a, it's an on or off switch mm -hmm. and on is completely on. Yeah. And he seems very analytical. The so. only way to manage it uh, in some cases is to follow a plan or structure that you set out beforehand. Cause when you're in the moment, it's almost well, as if you can't trust your feelings. Yeah. You just go too much. And I don't typically recommend tracking like every single yeah. weight and set and all that. But I think in the very beginning, in this instance too, because he's so analytical, it's mm -hmm. going to help him. Totally. Our next caller is Justin from Washington. What's up, man? How can we help you? What's going on, guys? How you doing? Good. Uh, Tab, dude. Sweet. Uh, happy to be on the podcast with you guys. I uh, just wanted to say thanks for all the awesome content you guys have created. Uh, I've listened to just about every episode. Uh, I found Mind Pump in December of 2017, and then I went back and listened to all of them pretty much. So, Oh, oh wow. Oh, man. Legit, legit fan then. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, sparkling <laughs> taints and everything. <laughs> oh, uh, so I'll just get going with my question here. Um, my goal and my question is um, I love to race my dirt bike in Enduro Hair Scrambles, which is an hour and a half race between track and trail. Um, and years past, I've been good enough shape to, you know, ride the whole race at a decent pace, but not really push myself and just kind of make it without getting out of control. Uh, but this year, I want to be able to ride as hard as I can the entire time, um, you know, and push myself uh, without getting hurt. So my heart rate is typically between 160 and 180 for the entire race, depending on how many times I crash. It spikes way high when I eat it. So then uh, the... The races are spaced out three to four or yeah, three weeks to a month apart. So I have a lot of time between them. And then there's eight races um, that start up on March 18th. So here pretty soon. Um, I'm currently in phase two of performance. Um, I add the um, OCR rice bucket to increase my hand strength. And I'm looking to hit the first race while in phase four. I'm, I'm a little behind, but I'm about to switch into phase three of performance. And then after that, my plan was to run maps strong. Uh, to keep my work capacity up, if that works. Um, so my main question is, during this in-season, if you call it, uh, what should my training look like to get my full potential during these weekend races? I ride almost every weekend uh, in the trails to keep my body used to riding. Uh, but I'd like to see if I could build my muscle endurance and stamina so that I could ride to my full potential, basically kick my friend's ass. <laughs> <laughs> you're on the right track, I'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah. so hold on. So in season, you're you're practicing every weekend. Is this Saturday and Sunday? 
Yeah, when I can, you know, if life doesn't get in the way. Okay. But I try to go at least once a weekend. Okay. And then when you go out on, on and, and do your riding, how long? Because a lot of people don't realize, so this is good for people to know as well. I trained um, some dirt bike uh, racers. And uh, this when I first trained them, I had no idea just how much stamina and endurance is required to do this. It's it's insane. A lot of people don't know that, but it's pretty crazy. Yeah. How long are you tra are you practicing for when you're going off on your own uh, on the weekends? So we typically will ride for, I don't know, an hour, an hour and a half, uh, take 10, 15 minute breaks, sometimes drink a beer, which is not okay. always ideal, but, <laughs> okay. and then, and then you ride, dude. you ride more. So, I mean, you ride for basically, I don't know, we're usually on the bikes for four or five hours. Okay. With well, you, you, okay. So, it, so my question, my answer would be different depending on, you know, what you just said. So you're riding once a week or so in season, except for when you're actually doing the competition, which is when, you know, when you're doing that, that long race, um, in that case, two or three workouts during the week would be totally fine. You could follow. I mean, there's, there's a lot of our programs would be appropriate for, no, I think what he's doing is actually pretty damn good. I, yeah, I, think I like performance. And I like strong. I like mm -hmm. the fact that you even added the rice buckets in from OCR. Yep. Like you're on a, a pretty damn good track. The only thing I could see that would make this better uh, for racing is to add a little bit more race practicing on the dirt bike and reducing maybe a workout. So if you had the ability to get to the track one more day a week and spend the hour and a half to two hours doing that instead of a lift, because you're doing plenty lifting wise to have strength, to yeah. have stamina, have endurance. The only thing that would make you even better at this race is to spend more time on the bike. Where do you find the, <laughs> your, like what's your weakness with, with, with your, with your performance? Is it the stamina? Is it strength? Is it, do you find pain anywhere yeah. on your body? Where do you fatigue uh, first, I, I guess. Uh, well, I'd say most fatigue is in my, well, my arms get pumped up, you know, arm yeah. pump. Uh, so that's why I worked in the rice bucket to kind of help that. But then like my lower back gets kind of tight um, towards the end of the race. Um, you know, it's just, uh, I would say my muscle endurance, like my stamina is what holds me back because I get tired and I start making mistakes, you know, and you hit trees and stuff. So I don't want to do that. So I, I just need to work on my yeah. endurance. Yeah. I so, mean, don't you guys agree? Like the, the, yeah. the biggest thing would be more riding. Of course. You know, yeah, I mean, 100%. A, another, another, like I would probably, another reason why the low back might hurt too, is you might be a little sore from the leg training and then you're sitting on a bike for three hours at a time. And so the bike or so your low back is locking up and being tight. So I, I might yeah. address some mobility work. I don't know if you take the time to do mobility before you get on the bike. I think that would be extremely beneficial to you, especially in the hips and yeah. low back. So like and nine, core yeah. strength yeah. and mobility. I think yeah, those are your two, two, one, two punches. Yeah. What I found. So okay. here, this is what's interesting about your scenario. You said your arms get pumped up. Uh, yeah. Most people love a pump in the workout. When you're, yeah. when you're doing what you're doing, you get a pump. Uh, and I saw, I had, actually there's two clients. I remember specifically, I had a drummer who had a band and he'd be like, man, my forearms get pumped and I can't play anymore. Yeah. And then the dirt bike rider said the same thing. He's like, how do I train mm -hmm. so I don't get a pump in my forearms? I remember when I first got that client, mm -hmm. I was like, I've never heard somebody not want to pump before. What actually that helps with that is frequent daily uh, exercise. It actually trains your muscles to not be, uh, not, not to get so pumped. Because once you get a pump, you kind of lose function. So I'm, yeah. I'm sure you already know this. You start to lose your grip and, and your dexterity and your fingers and your hands. So what you could do is you got your normal workouts, take out some of the exercises in there that are, let's say, low back intensity, low back intensive and hand intensive. And instead of doing them in the workouts, do a little bit every single day so you can condition your body to not get a pump mm. so easily. So mm -hmm. what you're working okay. on is stamina. You're lo lots and lots and lots of stamina rather than strength and building muscle because focusing on strength and muscle building is going to make you get a pump. You want, yeah. you're, you're looking more for that stamina and that waste removal process and not getting a pump uh while you're racing uh, yeah the way and you, you're using the rice buckets which yeah. i think is perfect and yeah. i try to slowly just progress that. the intensity uh, of that uh, a bit yeah yep. and like more more frequency more yep. volume of it but less intensity totally okay so how how many times should i do like say the rust rice bucket every day I do it? Yeah, every day every day yeah i would do it every day okay. but but not hard Yes. Because okay. if you do it hard every day, you're going to find some problems. Not hard, but a good goal would be to, I would say, increase time. 
Yeah. Right? So let's say, uh, like, let's say right now you can do the, yeah. the rice bucket for three to five minutes or something like that. And that's, that's a good amount of intensity. I might reduce it down to like two to three minutes every single day until that gets easy. And then I might try and get mm -hmm. it to a minute more and yep. then a minute more on top of that. And yep. so, and then do it a second time a day, you know, for another minute. Or yeah. Two. So just yeah. slowly build it up with the goal of, can you get in that yep. rice for, you know, 10, 15 minutes, no problem. And like you get that stamina Ooh. built up like that, it, that's going to yeah. carry over nice. Yep. Yeah. And I like huh. those work sessions for this, you know, and like carrying, um, uh, like doing farmer carries and doing uh, suitcase carries and things like that mm. too, where you just constantly kind of condition your body to withstand. But keep the intensity the, moderate yeah, exactly. at yes. most. You're not going high intensity on your hands and your forearms and your arms. Yeah. Grip strength is different than grip stamina. Yes. yes. So I mean, you, they they, they okay. definitely they definitely contribute to each sure, other. Sure, sure, yeah, definitely. Some having grip strength yeah. is going to carry over to some stamina, but you would get yeah. more benefit. Like let's say, like we we talk about farmer carries being a great exercise for grip strength. You doing you know forty yards of like you know three hundred pound carries or something like that's really great. But you you'd be better off doing a quarter of the weight for a longer period of time because the race is an hour yeah. and a half. You need more stamina. Yeah. With even your with your strength. core oh, okay. exercises, doing high reps is not you know the worst idea in this case in this instance in terms of like you being able to be conditioned uh, and not fatigue quite as, as frequently. Yeah, so frequent training, your training stamina, low to moderate intensity for those target areas. That'll, that'll, that should make a big difference. Okay, and then so like I could hit the weights like, because there's a month between them basically, so I could hit the weights uh, three weeks hard and then like maybe back off the last week, uh, yeah. the week of the race. Yeah, you especially, could do that. Especially uh, legs and stuff because you feel low back stuff so my theory would be you probably hit you know lunges or squats or you did something pretty hard that week and you're still kind of tight from that and then you go sit on a bike and that's probably locking the low back up mm -hmm. so the final yeah. week before you go do a race i'd actually probably pull out either all of your legs or reduce yeah. it to like just mobility type yeah. stuff yeah, your mobility. legs okay and then that okay. and, and watch what how you feel from that race totally. like two weeks okay that's perfect thank you you got cool. it man. um and then um, it's kind of like the, within the same, it's, it's called the, uh, it's another race, but it's way longer. I think it'd be pretty similar answer, but it's called the desert 100. Uh, it's a hundred mile race, which takes about five and a half hours um, on my bike as well, but it's pretty much the same thing. Correct. Yep. Just mm -hmm. exactly. Just more, more of the same. Yep. And, and then during this time I've, I've, I weighed about 255 about uh, two months ago now. Um, down to 226. Would it be a bad idea to to like cut? Because I'm trying to get, be lighter on my bike. Uh, I don't want to be heavy on the. You know, it's harder on everything. Yeah. Uh, would it be a bad idea to to cut like during the three weeks where I can lift, and then maybe like eat at a maintenance no. slash no. That's bulk? A, that's okay because okay. I so like this is a trade off. There's a trade off. You get the value of being lighter on your bike, which makes it easier. But the trade-off is less down. calories can yeah. sometimes sacrifice recovery um, yeah. and performance. So you can yeah. cut, but I would keep the cut very, very modest at yeah. most. So you're not going down five, 600 calories below maintenance. You're like two, 300 calories below maintenance. So slow cut is a smart way to do this. Don't be aggressive with it. Okay. All right, that makes sense. Yep. Perfect. You got it, man. Thanks for calling in. Awesome. I, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, good luck. Thanks, Circle brother. back. Let us know how you do, man. Okay. Thank you. Sounds good. Take it easy. All right. I just I just realized he said he rides his dirt bike for an hour, takes a break, drinks a beer, <laughs> and gets back on his bike. <laughs> yeah. again. Performance fuel cell. Yeah. Yeah, I don't yeah, know if that's yeah. is that a good idea, yeah. bro. <laughs> 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 Let's drink and then do this again. That's like par for the course dude, I know. with these guys. I love I it. Yeah. Crazy. But yeah, the stamina thing with the hands, uh, I remember uh, you know, doing judo and jujitsu, you, you know, you you're gripping the gi mm -hmm. and my you know forearms would get so pumped and then my hands were useless. Mm -hmm. I had the strongest hands in the gym, strong grip. But then when they got pumped, which I loved in the gym, I yeah. love a pump in the gym. But when I would grip a gi and my hands were pumped, well, it was like I had like useless claws. I couldn't do anything yeah, anymore. Yeah, you mentioned the drummer. Like I, this is like before we would play a show and I, I was even just playing guitar. Yes. And I, I think too, like some of the adrenaline going into it on yep. top of that, like it would just make these pumps like stupid where I could, I could barely even function with my fingers. Mm -hmm. So I had to like get over that and like really kind of like work through that. Yeah. So. And I remember, the, like I said, when I got these clients, I was like, 
uh, this is going to be hard because I've al- like I've always tried to get people to get a pump. Now I'm trying to figure out how to yeah. get someone ruins your dexterity to not get a pump. His know? two issues are the exact two things that will get me to get off my ATV. Like if I'm riding all day long, it'll either be my low back that bothers me or my, my forearms are gone yep. just because the vibrate the grip and vibration yep. on that thing all yeah, day long. It's a lot of stress. There. And uh, anytime it's my low back, it's because I was training that week and I hit like heavy squats yeah, or yeah. like something like that, and then my my hips are all locked up and tight and then it's pulling on my low back on there and so i started to realize like okay if i'm riding on saturday i'm going to just like really reduce the intensity on my legs and then before if i make a conscious effort of actually doing a really good 20 minute mobility especially like my 90 90 stuff before one huge difference yeah, you know what i did uh that really helped me with the grip stuff is i got a gripper and at first I messed up because I would do it throughout the day, but too high of intensity. Oh, yeah. Ended up giving myself tennis elbow. Then I went back and did it again. And then what I would do is throughout the day, I'd pick it up and I'd squeeze it. And the intensity, I'd keep it low. I'd just yeah. squeeze it, squeeze it, just low and intense, put it down. And I'd do this throughout the whole day. And I'd do up crazy stamina in my hands and forearms. Yeah, they have those cool ones where you can do individual fingers. Yeah. So I did the same thing. Yeah, yeah. But you got to keep the intensity yeah. low. Otherwise, you're going to screw yourself. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out some of our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram, Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram, Mind Pump Adam. And guess what? I'm back on Instagram, Mind Pump DeStefano. Here's where you'll find me. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was hardest. for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 